Pause the music. It's probably pretty loud at that setting, I think. Okay. Sure. Other stuff? I think we're good to go. I don't know why I want to stream to YouTube. Probably my camera goes down for some reason. Like when I stream on Twitch, I don't have this problem. But I was watching the other one from 10 weeks ago. I feel like the quality was bad. Like yeah, I think I think we're good. I think we're good. All right, so I can't believe it's been 10 weeks since we did the last one. Um, Fantasy Distraction number 20 came out today. Uh, which... All right, so um, what's going to happen is uh, we're going to recap Fantasy Distraction number 11 through 20 tonight. Um, I'm going to play the video, and then we're going to uh, talk about it a little bit, and then play the next one, and so on and so forth, and talk about a little behind-the-scenes stuff, and um kind of just cover like what what my thought process is when writing some of these and um just kind of gonna talk about it you know um nothing too crazy nothing too complicated um we're just gonna kind of jump right in it's uh not meant to be a super long stream but i know last time we it was like two hours two hours and like 40 minutes so um it might go that long, it might not, depends on what's happening, depends on uh, people come through the chat or not. Um, but for the most part, we will just kind of go on through and maybe I should make a Twitter post. A Twitter post somewhere. We should. I'll do that real fast, and then we'll start. Um, but yeah, nothing too too crazy tonight. Uh, like I said, I can't believe it's been 10 weeks. So we're going to just recap the uh, ones that have released. I guess it's more like nine weeks, right? Because I do it on the uh, the 20th, right? Like I do it on the 10th one. So it's more like it's been nine weeks since the last one. But still, it's that's a pretty long time uh, to last two. All right, yeah, I just make a post real quick. I'm um, doing these hashtags real quick. Oh, I was off by one letter. Don't you hate when you're like, uh, you know, Hashtagging on the old Twitter, and you you get all the hashtags you want, almost in, but you're off by one little thing. All right, tweeting it out. Boom. All right, so we're uh, we're just gonna jump right in. Um, we're gonna watch number eleven, then I'm gonna talk about it a little bit, and then we'll watch twelve, and so on and so forth. Um. Get, uh, let's get started here. So, so we'll see how many times I screw up uh, muting myself and then putting my thing back on and then, you know, uh, the camera stuff. And I, I screwed it up a couple of times last time. Uh, hopefully I don't screw it up as, as much. Uh, I guess I didn't do too, too bad last time. All right, so I'm going to switch this over to that. I'm going to mute myself. And uh, we're going to watch that, and then we'll talk about it. So this one is uh, Fantasy Distraction number 11. It'll pop up on screen. But, uh, this is actually the second story uh, specifically about Natalie. Um, 
he was the very first fantasy distraction we ever did. So uh, this was kind of like a big follow-up one. Um, so yeah, here we go. Hopefully I don't screw anything up. I'll be right back. The attack came in the night, a time of day when Natalie was at her weakest. The kingdom of Ilfor was just west of Elmore, and tensions had grown all over Fenrir as battles raged in the north. Battles that didn't concern the people of Elmore or Ilfor as far as Natalie knew. Awoken by screaming and fires being set, Natalai rushed to ensure her students' safety. Since that fateful day when the sun chose her as its vessel until now, Natalie had trained student after student in her dojo. However, nothing could have prepared them for this. Ilfor was a peaceful nation, and the king never showed ill will to the people of Elmore. Not only was this attack sudden, it didn't quite make sense. Things were not adding up, and Natalie wanted to search for answers, but the safety of her people was more important. She checked their rooms and saw them still asleep, so she hollered and screamed for them to get up, to prepare themselves for battle, and grab whatever valuables they could. When Natalie made her way outside, she could see the destruction Ilfor brought with them. Catapults hurled rocks into their buildings, most of which had been set ablaze by now, forcing Natalie to watch her own weapon of choice laying waste to everything she held dear. Her dojo was at the northernmost part of Elmore and required you to travel up a few stairs to reach it, so she knew they were the last line of defense when in reality they should have been the first. As the ill four knights approached the dojo, many of Natalie's students rushed to face them. She joined them in battle. Even if she could not use her fire powers, she was still a formidable foe and easily one of the best hand-to-hand -hand fighters on all of Fenrir. Unfortunately for her students, the Knights of Ilfor were covered in armor from head to toe and it made it difficult for them to land attacks that could harm the Knights. This didn't stop Natalie's blows from finding their mark though. Each strike, even through armor, had devastating results as Natalie danced through the Ilfor army in front of her. Despite her best efforts, Natalie's students soon grew overwhelmed, and those fortunate to not lose their lives in the scuffle retreated back into the dojo. Natalie took a few more knights down before following her students inside. She tried to calm them and prevent hysteria, but with their entire city burning in the distance, it was hard for her to do so. Soon her students became scattered throughout the dojo as the knights of Ilfor invaded. Natalie pushed through some of her own students and made her way deep inside the dojo. Luckily for her past heroics, Elmore gave her the biggest establishment for her and her students. She pushed deeper, occasionally being cut off or stopped by a knight that she quickly disposed of. Pushing through, fighting, she made her way to her destination. A golden bird statue said to be the most important item in Elmore. It was bestowed to her after she saved Elmore from the beasts that ravaged their crops. Standing in front of the statue was one of the knights of Ilfor. This knight was different. His armor was similar to the ones outside, but sticking out of the top of his helmet was a red feather. I wondered how long it would take for you to get here, said the knight. Natalie planted her right foot in front of her and readied herself for battle. Is the only language you speak battle? The knight scoffed. Natalie, chosen daughter of the sun. Natalie, wielder of flames. Natalie, fury, personified. For someone who never leaves Elmore, you seem to be gathering an awful lot of titles. The knight finally turned to face her and removed his helmet. Hend Severson, Knight of Ilfor, Mastermind of Blood River. Not as many titles as you, I'm afraid, but mine bear more meaning. Before Hend could continue, Natalie shot forward and caught him off guard with an elbow to his chest. The attack forced Hend to fall back into the bird statue. Before it could hit the floor, Natalie grabbed one end and Hend grabbed the other. You protect us like you know what it is, Hend yelled. It was true. Natalie didn't know why Ilfor would come for the statue, but she knew her opponent wanted it, and that was enough to defend it. She lifted her foot up and caught Hend square in the face, forcing separation, then ran for the door. 
In the next room, three knights were waiting for her and she launched herself forward, striking down the first knight, then tripped up the second before delivering a flying kick on the third. Now free once more, Natalie rushed the entrance. But a boulder from a catapult crashed through the front door and Natalie was forced to dodge out of harm's way. Forced to find another exit, Natalie ran to the room to her right. This was one of the largest rooms in the dojo and the place where Natalie held most of her classes. To her surprise, Hend beat her there and many of his knights stood behind him. Each knight had their sword pointed at the back of the neck of one of her students. Frozen in her tracks, Natalie raised her arms in surrender. Take me, she finally spoke. Just don't harm my students. Hend laughed. You're in no position to bargain, fire girl. That's not how this works. I'll be taking you all. Students are just here to make sure you comply without fighting. The Knights of Ilfor won that day, and Elmore was theirs. Natalie faced her first and biggest defeat and let her students down. When they were all taken to Ilfor, she thought they would be executed. But the King of Ilfor had other plans. Apparently, Natalai and all of her students had been sold as slaves to the Kingdom of Sabia. Hend escorted them to a boat that would see them across the sea. He made sure to see Natalai eye to eye one last time. Of course, at night. Natalai, with hands and feet chained together, stood at the entrance to the boat ready to deliver them to their new home. She had no idea what awaited her on the sand continent. But she refused to back down from Hend. The mastermind of Blood River went to speak, but Natalai headbutted him, causing his nose to bleed instantly. His knights came to his defense as he backed away from her. Pray. Pray, Knight of Ilfor, pray. Every single night that I never step foot on this continent again. Because if I do, I will burn Ilfor to the ground with a fury unlike any seen before. So I was laughing the entire time because Jake came in and said, sign my face. <laughs> oh my God. Let me know if uh, volume and, and everything is good, guys. Uh, I had to redo all my settings from the first stream because, uh, yeah, like it messed up all my settings. But uh, welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, also, our daddy is reading to, to us like I wasn't on, on camera at the time. I was just shaking my head. Literally just, ah. Uh... Niji, I appreciate you being here. <laughs> this man made me come all the way to YouTube. I know, guys, I know. I was going to do a Twitch stream and uh, just carry it over to YouTube, but I don't know. I just, uh, I thought this might be easier for me for now. Maybe, maybe next time. Is it all working? I don't think so. I don't think any, any emotes work here except like the basic ones, right? Not sure. I don't really know how YouTube streaming works, though. Uh, this is only my second time streaming on here. I have you seen these pieces of hair right here? Driving me bananas. All right, so that was the. Uh, they're still there. I'm triggered. All right, so that was the second Natalie story um, that we did. A um, little bit of a. Uh, Twist with her losing this time um, and being sent off to fight. Uh, well, you guys don't know that yet, but you will by the end of this stream session. But um, sent off as a slave to the kingdom of Sabia. Um, what even is YouTube for real? What kind of emote is that? Okay, so um, that one's pretty straightforward. I uh, felt like I needed to read that one since I read the original Natalie one. Um, Natalie ones in the future, I probably won't be reading. Uh, mostly just because we have so many uh, voice actors now, which is awesome, uh, to narrate things. So I will probably not narrate anymore unless I absolutely have to. Uh, which, like, you know, if somebody had to, like, cancel or they can't read one, uh, then I'll step in and I'll read it. Or if um, if we do collaboration ones, like um, 
Number 21 that's coming out next week, I'll be reading for one part. So um, like the collaboration stuff, I'll probably be reading. But for the most part, I shouldn't be reading anymore. Ooh, ooh uh, banana. But yeah, the um, <laughs> that's going to be really weird out of context if anybody hides the chat. Um, anybody who doesn't watch my, my Twitch streams, I tend to read everything that's put into chat. So um, if you hide the chat, uh, that was a chat message that I just read with the ooh, ooh, ah, uh, ah, uh, banana. All right. Um, thank you for that, June, a.k.a. Jake, who you're going to hear in the next one, I believe, uh, which I should probably set up while we're at it. But yeah, um, I probably won't be reading many more of these in the future um, outside of small parts here and there. So um, it's pretty nice to have options. Too good to read to us now. I just have so many, so many voice actors now. I've been blessed. Excuse me, I've been blessed with such talent in my community that uh, I don't have to. That's kind of nice. But yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> you just going to keep putting ooh, ah, uh, ooh, ooh, banana. Uh, so yeah, so Natalie um, gets, is the first one to get kind of like the second story specifically about her. Um, there's a lot of characters that are kind of referenced and brought up within other um, fantasy distractions, but she is the first one to specifically have one uh, that is about her and her story. So um, I thought it was an interesting take just to kind of move things along. Um, that's kind of going to be like a side story um, for, for quite a while on fantasy distractions. Um, I think most of our focus is going to be on um, the war between King Ingvar and Lord Kazai. So the things that are happening with Natalie are kind of going to be like a side story for now, but uh, but we will re revisit it um, more thoroughly in the future, and uh, it'll be more relevant to the uh, the kind of like overall story that we're doing um, later on. But for now, it's just kind of like gives us a reason to play a bit more in uh, Kingdom of Sabia, which is where Queen uh, Rima is from from the uh, the last set. Um, so not too much to really talk about here. Uh, Ilfor is going to come up more later, uh, as well as more information about Hend, the, uh, knight that defeats her. Um, not necessarily in one-on-one -on -one combat, but it, he's the knight who kind of, uh, orchestrates the, the means in which to defeat Elmore. So, uh, we will be visiting them more in the future. Um, not in this set, but um, they will be important down the line, and we will get back to them uh, in the next set for sure. We actually wrote um, an entire story about Ill4 uh, live on the Twitch stream uh, that will be in the next set. So definitely more Ill4 coming, but for now, um, uh, this is... Pretty much, we get one more story that links to this one um, on a little bit of a smaller scale, but but nothing too too serious going on in this one. Um, at least not anything that affects the main story time soon. But it's all set in some groundwork for things to come. All right, the next one that we have is going to be uh, Birch, the Brexen Butcher. Uh, this one is read by uh, June. Stories you first. often hear. Uh, hold on. Went too early. Um, this one is read by June in chat, aka the Pizza King, aka our buddy Jake. Um, if you haven't heard any read by him yet, uh, you're in for a treat. He is an incredible voice actor. Um, Jay, thank you so much for the lurk, man. I appreciate it. Um, he's an incredible voice actor and, um, he's done an amazing job with not only this one, but every single one of the fantasy distractions that he's read. Uh, we have him come on as a guest whenever we do the, uh, podcast for Twitch. 
Uh, he's been known to pop into my Discord with me when we're writing them live on Twitch. Um, so Jake has been a huge, huge help in uh, in getting Fantasy Distractions um, to bump up its quality quite a bit. Um, I think every single voice actor <laughs> that is included in Fantasy Distractions right now is uh is one of his friends so our entire cast of voice actors probably wouldn't happen without him so uh lurk command not necessarily i think i could set up commands for the youtube chat i haven't done that yet uh i guess it's something we could do in the future if um these streams get more viewers i'm i might just do the next stream on on twitch and just upload it to YouTube next time. So yeah, June, June is Jake. Uh, if you want to link like your Twitch um, in the chat, I do voice stuff, promote stuff, write stuff, and brought every voice actor here. Yeah, exactly. If you want to put your um, Twitch link in the chat, I think anybody that watches this video should be able to see that. Um, so maybe if people watch this, like once it's up on YouTube, maybe, maybe they'll be able to get to your channel. That'd be awesome. Uh, but Jake streams a lot. He plays video games. He, uh, he does a lot of cool voice acting stuff on YouTube and has been a huge help. And, uh, he did amazing with, uh, Birch. Gave him a lot of, uh, life, which you're going to see in this one when we get to it. Uh, do you have videos with the text or posted elsewhere with text? Um, thank you for bringing that up, Niji. Um, I just started doing something like that. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a website. I think it's, it's like Papas, P A P A S. I actually just started a thing for that so that I can post them with just the text. I've only posted the first one so far. Let's see if I can, uh, Slap the link in here. I only posted the first one, um, but I'm planning to post the rest up over the next couple of days. If I... um, here's my Twitch and here's episode one of Fantasy Distractions, but only text. Yeah, I, I posted the link, Jake, but uh, but make sure you share your Twitch too. Did it not let you, uh... You want me to come in? It just tried to block a message from you, too. You want me to come in and give my thoughts on the reading? I tried to really get myself in character for this one. <laughs> oh, it blocked it because you said the S word. Okay, we could... Um, I could put your Twitch. Maybe it's not going to let you, uh... Post links. I didn't really set up anything for this yet. <laughs> Because I'm smart. Unfortunately, I retain things better if I'm... Uh, did that not link? Oh, because it's twitch.tv. Pro player, by the way. Hold on. I'm on it. Does that work? My other link. Do I actually have to put HTTPS? I'm triggered. I don't know how YouTube streaming work. I'm gonna I'm gonna open your stream and just like it. Hold on. I have no idea how this works. And it shows. I don't know if my links yeah, I don't think they sent. Hold on. I'm just gonna open up your stream. I want people to be able to find you, man. Don't you have Genshin to go fail at? Dang, how are you gonna how are you gonna do her like that? Um, yeah, if you follow that first link that I I sent, Niji, you can read the first one. I'm gonna be uploading the other ones over the the next couple of days. Um, I just found out about that website today. Did this mess up my camera? You guys could see my green screen. You see a rip in the space-time continuum. Oh no, that's my uh, that's my mic. <laughs> but my my camera is kind of scuffed right now. The background. This is like if you ever watch me on Twitch. This is ninety-nine percent of my streams is just me screwing stuff up. 
and trying to fix it. I think I made it worse. Fine. Um. Anyway. Whoa, whoa, sir. I finished Genshin for the night. I actually have stuff to do on Genshin. We might actually stream that this week. I actually have stuff to do on that game. Crazy. All right, we're getting sidetracked <laughs> from what this stream is about. Um, as per usual. I, uh, I mean, you could come on and uh, give some insight for uh, the ones that you did if you'd like, I think. Gonna go grab a cold one to crack, nice. All right, so we're gonna watch Birch. Um, this one is read by Jake, AKA June in chat, the pizza king. And, um, and then we'll talk about it. Give me one sec, cause I'm totally prepared for everything at all times. Stories you often hear are all about acts of heroism. But not this one. Consider this story a warning. Mercenaries are common in Brexen, so the fact that this story includes a group of mercenaries shouldn't come as much of a surprise. But mercenaries also come in many shapes and sizes. This particular band of money-hungry mercs involves three key players, and if you've lived in Brexen, or you're just passing through, you know of them. Firstly, there's Zayla. Don't ask me how a run-of-the-mill sorceress specializing in teleportation magic and having a knack for sweets is the most normal of the bunch, but somehow, she is. I wouldn't underestimate her, though. If she turned you into a toad, you could consider yourself lucky. I once bore witness to a job that they were involved in, and she seared a demonic melanchlin right down to its bones, and then froze the bones and stepped on them. Don't know what a demonic melanchlin is? Well, that's a story for another day, I suppose. Next up, we have Luxie. Don't let her pretty, cutesy name fool you. While Zayla turns the demons to dust, a lot of us here in Brexen think Luxie is a demon herself. Pale skin. So pale, it's like she's been coated in white paint. At least, that's what the few people who have seen the skin under her hood say. If you see these mercs and Luxie is with them, you should be scared. But not as scared as you should be when you see them without her. That means she's in the shadows somewhere, and your throat is as good as slit. She'll flay you if the price is right, and from what I hear, the asking price is usually not as high as you would think. Just the thought of Luxie gives me the chills. But there is still one more in the group we didn't mention yet. Birch. They call him the Brexen Butcher, and for good reason. Before he met Zayla and Luxie, he would only take jobs that were located in Brexen. He felt it was the best way to build his reputation. But the next thing you know, he's terrorizing the people of this town day in and day out. Let's face it, a town which most mercenaries call home isn't going to have a lot of rules. So terrorizing people didn't stop at getting money or ruining someone's business. No, if you wanted someone in Brexen dead, you called Birch. That's not to say the killing didn't stop when he met Zayla and Luxie. If anything, it got worse. But the girls helped Birch expand his horizons, and these three menaces started finding work elsewhere. Yet, there isn't a soul in Brexen still breathing that has forgotten the day three years ago. The day these three mercs found each other. Not to sound cliche, but it was a day like any other. Birch often spent his mornings taking jobs in local bricks and bars, his afternoon executing the job, and God knows what at night. After he woke, he made his way down to one of those bars, the most popular among mercs in Brexen, the Tooth Sweetener, and approached a board set up for work. Weirdly enough, the board only had one piece of paper on it when normally it's full to the brim. Birch looked around the bar, curious, before walking over to the piece of paper. 
When he read it, he was surprised to only see his name on it. He stared at the piece of paper for a moment, knowing what this entailed, and turned around slowly. Everyone else in the bar was now standing, and their weapons were drawn. The other mercs and Brexen did not respect Birch or his actions, and this seemed like the best way to deal with their problem. Needless to say, no one in Brexen thought this through. Birch was not your typical fighter, nor your typical mercenary. He was a monster of a man, both in height and mass. Unlike other mercenaries, he didn't fight with a sword or a spear. He just used his bare hands. The ensuing fight was a long one, and a few of the mercenaries landed an attack or two on the hulking merc, but majority of the damage was done by Birch himself. I remember it clear as day, as I was also in attendance. Picked a weird day for a morning drink I did, but at least I lived to tell this story. I cowered in a corner of the bar and watched as Birch received very little punishment and dealt a ton of it out. A cut here and a slash there. Birch took the attacks with a smile on his face. When it was his turn to dish some damage of his own, he made sure he returned the sentiment tenfold. I remember catching a glimpse of the barkeep as he ducked behind his counter to avoid a body thrown his way. I recall the rest of the workers in the bar that morning running out the front door as soon as they could, the moment they saw Birch's reaction to the paper. I also remember thinking that this had to be the end of the Brexen Butcher no matter what the outcome. There was no way one man could take on an entire town's worth of mercenaries alone. Not even a man as monstrous as Birch. Then I felt something brush against my sleeve that nearly caused me to wet my breeches. Luxie was there, and somehow hiding beside me, or behind me, even though I was hiding in a corner. She slithered her way to one of Birch's adversaries and caught him down. As Birch wound up a punch, his target in front of him turned to ice and exploded on impact as Zayla teleported into the bar from my right and assisted Birch. Birch alone was proving to be a handful for these mercs, but with Zayla and Luxie helping him, the rest of the confrontation was over in mere seconds. Birch still stood on the defensive, blood coating his knuckles as the two women approached him. He looked at the carnage around him. Why did you help? he asked. Zayla grabbed a complimentary snack left on the counter that somehow survived the ruckus and took a bite. I don't think she liked it because she quickly put it back down and pushed it away. It didn't seem like much of a fair fight, that's all. And you? Birch turned his attention to the cloaked Luxie. Personally, I'm just tired of Brex and mercenaries. Luxie turned around and made her way for the door. Tired of Brexen in general, added Birch. What do you say the three of us find work elsewhere? Zayla simply tipped her hat, then made her way toward the door as well. Birch wiped some blood from his mouth and laughed as he followed the two women out, but not before stopping and locking eyes with me. I was a bit surprised, to say the least. I chose to hide too close as Luxie and Zayla teleported behind me. I lucked out twice already, and I wasn't sure a third time was going to happen. But Birch pointed to me and said words I will never forget. Thank the gods for this day. The day Birch spared you. The day you were blessed with the honor of telling our story. And pray. Pray every night of your life to whatever you believe in, that you never cross paths with us again.
All right, I have <laughs> I have two things about that one that uh that I messed up. Okay, Jake did amazing. It has nothing to do with Jake. Jake killed it. Absolutely crushed it. Um, the music cutting out when Birch goes to speak could have been smoother. It kind of just cuts off and then he speaks and then it kind of cuts back on weird. I could have faded that in and out better. I'm still learning, all right? This was only 12 weeks in, all right? I I'm going to get better with time. I promise. The other thing... Um, Maybe most people won't notice it until until this live stream. So maybe I shouldn't say it, but I will anyway, because why not? Um, the end of Natalie, number 11. She tells Hand to pray. Pray that she never comes back. And then the the this one, Birch tells this dude in the bar to pray, pray that he never crosses paths with them again. And I was just like, after I released it, I was, and I listened to them back to back on the playlist, I was like, dude, I did that twice. He did more than all right, okay? He did amazing. Uh, Jake, do you, do, you wanna, do you wanna chat a little bit about it? Uh, I mean, you can just pop in and, and give some commentary for the ones that you did, I guess. Um, let's see. Uh, fantasy distractions voice channel, I guess. I gotta put my uh, thing of my bobber on. The thing of my bobber. When I, when I lift my head back, you can see my green screen for some reason. Is it my headset that blocks that? Oh, my headset blocks just enough of the lighting to get rid of the green screen on top. That's so bizarre. So weird. Anyway. <laughs> See if we can get Jake on the I'm saying it like he's going to fall into a radio show. Yo, yo, yo. Yo. What up, man? Nothing much. Just hanging as per usual. Hanging. Um, so <laughs> so this is the Pizza King on the line. I don't know. I said it like I was about to like have you call into a radio show for some reason. But, <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, so you did the the narration for Birch. An amazing job. Don't listen to Snidgy, okay? <laughs> you did an amazing job. I'm looking up the uh, the script so I can like look at it again. Yeah. This was number twelve, right? Yes. Okay. But all right, I've got it up. Did you want to ask anything or? Um, give me one sec. So really professional. Linked, linked in everywhere but the fantasy distraction discord i mean only the voice actors are in here so yeah for now until we get a you know a proper thing for the patreon Are you messaging for everyone if they want to come in? Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to like ping everybody, but I'll just drop it in there if people want. I might ping everybody. <laughs> I'll ping everybody. <laughs> It'd be I mean that's the probably the best way that they're going to get the message. I know most of them are kind of like I I came up with the idea of having maybe having Janine and Sassy do 28 together, like voice, mm -hmm. either like echo their voices or, you know, man, it keeps blocking all your messages because you keep cursing. I got to allow them. I didn't <laughs> curse. I said pussy. I could be talking about a cat. Can you, uh, can you not curse on this screen? Live? It could have been a cat. <laughs> <laughs> uh 
They just said no, no, I tease. He did really well. I think that's the second time I heard that story. Oh, okay. Nice. It is a good story. All right. So um, I will ask a question. Don't mind if I do. It is a good story. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. We got the Thank uh, you. popping of the. Um, that's signifying that I am ready. <laughs> um, so, what was it like voicing Birch and narrating his story? Um, it was an interesting story because so when you send these to me, I don't usually read them right away. Mm -hmm. Like I, I usually read them when I record them. Right. And I take it like paragraph by paragraph, right? Um, normally when I submit voice lines to people, I submit multiple takes of, of each line so that they can pick and choose what they want. But that's, you know, I don't want to send you like a 30 minute file of me reading paragraphs three or four times. Right. Um, so oftentimes I just read the paragraph for the first time when I sit down and record it. So I go into it with like the information you have given me about it and that's it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I told I, I've told Zaf about this as well because he's you know he he's asked a couple times like how do you kind of go about doing these and it's like really when I read it out loud it kind of gives me an idea of like th what he's going for um, what the theme and kind of feel of the story is so there's like a huge difference between the the Birch story and the Tabor story even from paragraph one. Um. But it's like a lot of the the inflection and all that comes from just what I'm getting and what the vibe of the story is from there. Right. But um, it was also it was it was a an interesting story because these three characters, like Luxy and and uh, Birch and Zayla, sound like the people that would not ever hang out with anyone ever. Right. Yeah. But like the three of them are now all hanging out, and it's like. It was intriguing because you know you brought them in and it's like yes it's primarily about birch but this is also the story of how he met them yeah and and i think that was like the most important part because we're going to do stories with the other two and we're going to do stories with all three of them in it more yeah so like establishing him and what he's all about and why they end up together like it is true like they don't really hang out with people they kind of just do their own thing but all yeah. three of them kind of have the common, like, they're bored with life and what's yeah. going on in Brexit that they're just like, hey, why not the three of us just go out and see what's out there? Uh, yeah. Because this is so, kind of lame yeah. now. It was just, it was very interesting to see these three like-minded people who just don't tolerate people deciding, you know what, I'll tolerate you for now. Yeah. And we'll and, go do our own thing. Um, the interesting part about, like, a lot of it is um, they probably wouldn't have gone out of Brexit much without each other either. So, like, we've established that Zayla likes sweets, and uh, mm -hmm. she, she's, like, an Easter egg in the next one coming up that's about a bakery. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I feel like she would never have gone to that bakery without traveling with them. So it's, like, it's almost like giving them a lot more personality and character, even though they're kind of bad people. Like, they're bad guys yeah. for the most part. But, uh, yeah. And it's like that this this meeting is what's going to expand each of their characters because right. otherwise they like would just stay there. Um, I also think like when I was when I was reading it and it got to like the moment I saw that there was only one piece of paper on the board and Birch was like, what in my head? I was just like, oh, yeah, there there people are asking to kill him now. Yeah, this is this is going to go south so fast. He's getting set up. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so it was an interesting story to me just because it's like if Birch is just a guy, like if he's just a human and he managed to like mess up all these people that tried to kill him, dang. Yeah. <laughs> like I also want to like know why. Yeah, it's like I you know, that sparks the intrigue of like how is he that strong? It did did something happen or is he just a dude that decided i'm gonna be buff now and kill everyone you know yeah well he is pretty much just a big dude like he's just a really strong human and uh 
the fact that he's now going to have like uh, a witch essentially and a potential like demon rogue like character uh, running around with him he's like unstoppable kind of yeah uh, just because he was already pretty dangerous before and now yeah he's got all these other factors uh, mm-hmm. behind him so it's uh, no they'll be coming back into the fold and I, I think it'll be interesting to see who or what they fight against them. but we, yeah. we are going to do some stories about the other two mm-hmm. uh, Mr. Pizza is at a much higher volume than you it might have also been because I was like close to my mic talking I was excited <laughs> I'm going to lower you in discord because I don't want to mess yeah, too much with be a my, good idea. Um, my settings in OBS just for the yeah over you a little bit see if that helps let me know if that's better snoogie i will say you definitely are like on the quiet side oh on even on on the stream in general yeah okay, i could turn yeah. that up that i could fit in obs but yeah no i like i adore reading these stories for like the first time and being able to and it's not like a it's not some cheesy like I don't read them until I get it so that I can like give you the genuine emotions yeah, that I feel yeah. right away because like if that were the case I'd read the whole thing once and just send it to you clean right um but it's it is so like it's exciting to read them right away because I think that does help a little bit I get excited to read them yeah. um and so when I like actually sit down to record them, it's like, you know, I'm energized. I'm ready to do it. With me, it's um, like if I'm recording them, which like I said earlier, I might not record another one for a while. But like when I'm recording them, even though I'm the one writing them, uh, like if I don't record it for a while after I wrote it, but I know I'm going to be the one voicing it, it, uh, <laughs> it gives me time to uh, like act it out in my head a couple of times. So like it gets me more excited for the reading too because I'm I'm starting to piece together like how I'm gonna do it, like the uh, the Starlight Samurai one, I had no intention of doing it with an accent, uh, because I don't do accents like I'm I'm not a voice yeah. actor, uh, but then I ended up doing it and I thought it wasn't terrible so I just rolled with it, and um, like I actually really like it the way that it came out so I uh, yeah I had time to kind of like think about that while the art was being made because the first two i had to wait for the art before i actually put them together so uh mm-hmm. while i was waiting for the art i did a lot of that like trying to figure out how i was going to read it and uh, like i'm sure it's the same for you guys like when i get you the file like nice and early and you guys read yeah. it ahead of time it, give, it gives you time to kind of like piece together how you're going to do it and... that's not how i do it but <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm sure the others <laughs> might you know yeah yeah but yeah, I I find it funny too that I keep getting these roles of these characters that like are these big massive people. So it's like every single one of them has got to have that yeah. gruff. <laughs> but, uh, like, <laughs> well, we got that coming up soon in Ingvar yeah. on on fifteenth. So, oh uh, boy, that one's like I I like having every once in a while one that just has um like the character just speaking a lot at the end yeah Doing their own that's model. a good way to like dramatically end something yeah yeah well, so natalie does and that's kind of like a theme in this set i think natalie does it uh birch does it ingvar does it yeah um i feel like there's one more that i remember but yeah it's like it's kind of funny that that's kind of like a theme <laughs> of this set. i do want to do sets that have actual themes later but i'm still figuring yeah um, all right, last question, and then I'll, I'll bring you back in for Ingvar. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. trying to keep this stream under three hours, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> We're already at an hour. Um, uh, all of the bars in these stories. Um, I don't know why I keep going the sweets route. Yay or nay? Okay. Yay. Okay, we'll just keep having all the bars. <laughs> be the tooth sweetener and brownies and stuff and 
my sister was like every time i watch these i, I get hungry because like i always seem to have some kind of like food reference thrown in i mean this next one is is gonna make everybody hungry in chat yeah. probably but <laughs> uh but yeah uh anything else you want to say i mean you're gonna be back in like two of these anyway yeah i'll be back I, we can we can talk more then <laughs> all right sounds good man. thank you for coming on yeah no problem talk to you in a little bit yep All right, that was our buddy, the Pizza King, aka Jake, aka June, aka Mommy. And uh, we're gonna just jump right into the next one. Yeah, so uh, I mean, that's pretty much it with Birch. That's kind of like all I really wanted to talk about with that one is that they will be back. Like uh, Zayla will be back. Uh, they're actually kind of in this next one as like a little Easter egg almost immediately after their story. Uh, but we're going to be doing, we're going to be giving Zayla her own story. We're going to give Luxie her own story. And they're going to pop up throughout the fantasy distractions as kind of like villains for some of the heroes. Um, as well as like anti-heroes too, because um, we're going to be fleshing out their character quite a bit. Uh, and I'd like to use them more because of that. I got to get the settings of my camera right on YouTube. For some reason, I feel like compared to Twitch, my camera is not as clean. I got to figure that out. My man. But yeah, I uh, got to figure that out. Because when I was watching back the, the first stream, just to remember how I did everything, because that was 10 weeks ago or nine weeks ago, um, I noticed the quality of my, my camera is pretty bad. Down for a lot. Hold on, Janine. Um... So I got to try to fix that for uh, future streams. I got nine to 10 weeks to figure that out. So uh, I'm either going to figure that out or maybe the next stream will be on Twitch and then we'll just put it on YouTube. For now, we're going to watch uh, number 13. Number 13 is about um, a baker. So there's a lot of food references in this one. And uh, it's read by our good friend Janine. Who I will link her Twitch. If you guys are curious. Um, to check her out. I know that I have to pull up the actual stream now, <laughs> or else it's not gonna link properly. Um, if you guys nope, that's not the link. That's not even close. What did I what did I even link? What? Did I not copy this somehow? Pro streamer, by the way. There it is. Nailed it. All right. Um. All right. Let's do this. We got Dana, the Baker of Midport, coming up next, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, thank you again to Jake for coming on and and chatting with us about. Um, Birch. We're going to have him back on for number 15, which he also read, which is a story about King Ingvar. And uh, for now, we're going to watch this. I will be back. Enjoy. Life has been turned upside down for a lot of people on Fenrir these days. None more so than the people living in Midport. Imagine stretches of land that seem to go on forever, laying smack in the middle of two warring nations. Obsidian, ruled by King Ingvar, is to the west of Midport, and Onyx, ruled by Lord Kasai, is to the east. These two nations have been fighting for so long that Midport's very existence is because of their war. Let that sink in. These two have been at war for so long that entire places of commerce have developed to capitalize on the fact that their war is far from over. Now I know we are all tired of hearing about King Ingvar and Lord Kasai's legendary battle on the mountaintop of Sha'er, and even more tired of hearing about the war. So you're in luck. The story is now going to pivot away from that and become about yours truly. So what makes me more interesting than those two? Nothing, actually. I'm a lowly blacksmith working in Midport, and I hardly get time off due to the aforementioned war. What I want to talk about today, though, is what I do when I get those rare moments of reprieve. Let's see. About four months ago, I got a day off. The day before I hurt myself churning out a couple of katanas for Lord Kasai's new recruits. My boss showed me some mercy and let me have a day to heal. I spent that day going up and down Midport, trying to figure out if there were any places around that I had missed. I thought I'd been everywhere, tried everything and experienced every shop. 
Obviously I was wrong, or this would have been a pretty short story, right? I found a place with large glass windows that I could have sworn was a shop for trinkets, but when I peered inside, I saw something very strange. Shelves upon shelves of baked goods lined the counter that was positioned perfectly from the window. I thought to myself, why would someone sell sweets in the middle of wartime? It made no sense, especially in the one place designed to be a shop for those in war. I decided to go inside, and it was as if I'd been transported to a new world. There had been this magical world hiding right here in Midport, right under our noses. Speaking of our noses, the smell of this place was unlike anything I'd smelled before. A delicious sugary aroma lured me in as if it possessed my body, and the next thing I knew I was in front of one of the glass shelves I just described to you. I knelt down and peered inside. To the left were carefully made bite-sized chocolate-covered donuts as if they were made by a group of pixies, each one precisely positioning a sprinkle. Then to my right, a contraption I had never seen before magically drizzled a buttery glaze upon a stack of brownies. See anything you like? The face of the owner looked back at me from the other side of the glass. I gathered myself and stood up, hardly containing the smile on my face. That was the day I met Thana, the owner of this place, named after her. She is just as delightful as her products. There were tables set up inside the shop, so I purchased my goods and took a seat. Thana wanted to know what I thought, and I felt it necessary to provide her with my immediate feedback. To make things less awkward for my first encounter with Thana, I simply purchased one of those tiny donuts and the glazed brownie both of which overjoyed my palate, and after I told Thana how I felt about her work, she told me to sit tight. Curious, I relaxed and drank the coffee I purchased along with my treats. I saw numerous customers come in and get help from a young lady who worked alongside Thana. When Thana returned to my table, she presented me with a cupcake. On the house, she said with a smile. Thanks for your feedback, she added. My pleasure, I responded, attempting to hide my excitement. Thank you. After Thana left my table, I eyed this particular delicacy with much satisfaction. I hadn't had a cupcake in ages, and now knowing the quality of what Thana was making, I think I felt the saliva accompanying my watery lips for the first time. Ingvar thought himself a god when he presented himself to the people of Obsidian, and I too shared the sentiment in this moment. Me, the lonely blacksmith, now made divine, and this cupcake an ambrosial gift from one of my devoted. Well, truthfully, it's hard not to get excited when presented with free food. The cupcake in question lived up to expectations and thwarted me to the point that I decided that any day off I could find the time to visit Thana's bakery, I would take the opportunity. So I did just that. I made a habit out of attending her shop quite often. I tried to get the same table every time I went. It was the best table, out of the way, and easy to people watch from. I tried a new suite each time, and Thana often let me sample her new products. Outside of conversing with Thana, I just sat there quietly enjoying my guilty pleasure. Sure, it wasn't the healthiest habit, but it gave me a much needed break from the gloom of the world around us. I was often surprised by the people who visited the shop. Rare moments when you could tell it was both Obsidian Knights and Onyx soldiers awkwardly being kind to each other in the place of business. Whenever that happened, I would joke with Thana that maybe her sweets could end the war. That always seemed to get a chuckle out of her and her assistant. Then there was this odd woman with a witch's hat that would often frequent the establishment. She always traveled with two other people, but the other two never came into the bakery. Now that I think about it, all three of them dressed rather strangely, but she was very picky about her sweets. The real serious type that rarely cracked a smile, but I think she meant well. She always treated Thena with kindness, even if she gave off a frightening aura. The rest of the customers are what you would expect. Children with their parents, other workers from Midport, and the occasional newly drafted recruit. It gave me great joy to just sit there, enjoy my snack and my beverage, and admire the work that Thana was doing for the people of Midport. None of us asked for this life. None of us wanted to live through this long and grueling time of war. But if it ever ends, I'll be sure to ask Thana where she takes her shop next. These breaks get me through the bad times and the good times. One day, as I watched the witch point and asked questions about different treats, Thana's assistant answered to the best of her ability, Thana herself working hard behind the counter to prepare something for an obsidian knight on the other side. I thought to myself, Thana is the light in the darkness that Fenrir needs most right now. She may not be able to turn the tide of war or a diplomatic struggle, but she provides happiness on a scale that will carry on even after the war is over. As much as I wish I was special, I also think about how many others out there were like me unaware of what they were walking into and having their lives changed by the simplest gesture. 
Thena had a power, a power that most people lacked. It wasn't magic like the witch, or skill in battle like those from Onyx or Obsidian. It was a rarity on Fenrir. It was kindness. Plus, like I said earlier, it's hard not to be excited about a free cupcake. All right, I'm hungry. I don't know about you guys, but I had a I had a chocolate muffin earlier. It was mad good, but I still kind of want something sweet now. Um, Janine's accent is still like the best thing to me. I, I love her accent so much. Uh, she did an amazing job with this one. Um, uh, probably one of my most detailed fantasy distractions up to this point. Uh, I had a lot of fun writing this one. Um, and just like sneaking in little like Easter eggs, like like Zayla just coming in and like buying sweets and stuff, and like Birch and Luxy waiting outside for her. I don't know. I just thought like that was a nice little uh thing to just kind of like throw in there. Um, which I had always kind of planned to do. Um, and Thana's story actually wasn't supposed to be number 13. So like typically with the Easter eggs and stuff like that, I I want them to happen like later, you know, like like we just heard the story of Birch and now they're kind of like popping up in this story as a little like Easter egg type thing. Uh, I'm trying to make that happen a little bit more um, like not as obvious, I guess. But I mean, you know, it, it's meant to be like you're you're supposed to know who they are. But uh, my intention wasn't to have it be back to back, like with Sela being literally in the next one. Uh, right after the birch story but but uh it is just like a fun little extra thing and i i just thought this was a funny one in general because it's uh it's it's lighthearted where like most of our stories have been pretty dark and will be mostly dark um but i want to kind of sprinkle in these like lighthearted fun ones every once in a while and uh uh, not that it's, like, completely lighthearted, because it's still, like, a baker in the middle of wartime in, like, a hub where a lot of the people in the war are meeting up to, like, restock and stuff. But, uh, but I thought it was kind of, like, an interesting story, and I, I thought it was uh, funny in the sense that it's kind of like what I would expect from like a medieval Yelp review. Like, like this guy is basically just going into, he finds this bakery. First of all, I probably could have wrote it better because it sounds like he only gets a day off every four months at the beginning. But he's referencing like one day off he got because he was like hurt. He found this bakery, and now when he has other days off, he goes there, like, for the last four months. But it sounds like he only gets a day off every four months at the beginning, but that wasn't the intention or uh, what, I, what I meant. But um, a lot of these recap streams are just turning into me, like, pointing out the mistakes that I made. Uh, and that will probably continue to happen for the foreseeable future, uh, probably for the entire existence of Fantasy Distractions. But, uh, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. Janine did an awesome job. It was nice to have a, a little lighthearted um, um, story thrown in. And uh, I thought about, like, adding more character to, like, the girl that's assisting Thana and stuff like that. But um, I don't think we'll really, like, touch on that too much unless Thana pops back up into the story somewhere. Uh, but I think... Uh, We'll probably just leave this like as is. We we might reference her bakery later, um, in the stories that are more focused on like wartime and uh, and when Midport is more of a big deal, uh, which right now it kind of isn't. Um, when I was writing the first set and the second set, or most of the second set. Um, my plans for the series were a bit more drawn out. Um, I think I mentioned this on the last stream, the last recap stream, but basically it's like, um, I was really dragging things out and I had a conversation with my mom actually that put things into perspective a little bit that, um, every 52 weeks will be like a year's worth of fantasy distraction. So I was thinking like 
long term drawing everything out and i'm like man like what i have planned is literally like three years worth of stuff and i had left a lot of gaps to like fill in more stories so then i condensed everything because i didn't want it to take three years to get to a lot of these stories that i want to do so um i condensed things down quite a bit and we're now shifting to um sets which are a, a set of 10 and blocks which are going to be like a set of 50 basically so um we're currently in the what i call the like origin slash fenrir block um and the the second block which will be from like 51 on is going to be um like what we consider the war time so like it'll go heavily into onyx versus obsidian uh ingvar versus kazai uh a lot more once we get past 50 um we're still going to reference the war and we might still do stories that are set within the war time uh through the first 50 but for the most part uh, i'm going to kind of like stop doing that and just focus on more like pre-war time so that way when we get past 50 uh, we can really, really go into uh, like the, the war itself. So um, I didn't actually like come up with that idea until we were like, uh, I, I think I didn't really come up with that idea until maybe before I wrote number 15. So uh, that's why like kind of a lot of these are like borderline or, or set within the wartime like this one was. Um, but for future ones, we'll probably kind of go away from that and just focus on um, pre-war time. And then it'll make the ones that come up after 50 uh, more um, special, I guess, or at least more focused on that part of the story where they're actually in war. Um, but yeah, that's like kind of where we're at. That's why we have some that are set within war time now. But uh won't be much in the future until after 50. i'll explain more about that as we go along as we get closer to 50. uh i'm gonna try to get maybe like a new or a modified version of the logo uh as well as like something that actually says like block number two and then the name of that block and then uh then i'll explain more about it when, when we get to the 50 at the fantasy industry, which Seems like it's really far away, but the way these weeks are going, I can't believe we're at the uh, the 20 fantasy distraction celebration already. So um, 50 might come up sooner than we think. But so that's pretty much it for the Dana one. It's great. Janine did amazing. Uh, it was a fun one to write. And, uh, just a fun one. We're all a little bit more lighthearted than uh, some of the other ones up until this point. The next one is about a character named Ilya, whose name I feel like I always say wrong. I'm never really sure. I'm pretty sure it's Ilya. We're going to hear Sassy say it in a bit. Speaking of our friend Sassy, this is the first one that she did for us. I'm going to link her Twitch as well for anybody that stumbles upon this stream in the future. Hopefully it pops up in chat. Um, Sassy did this one. This is her first one with us. She is going to be doing another one later in the set. Um, but she is amazing as well. Um, did you work on your world building first or just dove right into the writing? So I was planning to release an ebook that is kind of set in the same universe as the story, as a lot of these stories. Um, so I kind of did a lot of the world building already uh, for that ebook idea. And then I just um, started to work on these without the intention of it being connected to that ebook at first. Um, but then it just kind of like merged together. And I started to expand in a whole different way than I was planning for the ebook. Uh, so we're going to tie in stuff that I had worked on for that ebook later. So the ebook that I was working on actually does um, 
tie into the wartime. So once we get into wartime, which will, I guess that'll be the next like block, um, we'll be exploring a lot of the stuff that I had planned for the ebook. Um, and then like all this extra stuff around it is just stuff I've been coming up with either like as I write the fantasy distractions. Um, some of it's just been like on the fly. Um, a lot of it is just kind of like filling in gaps. Like if I know I want a certain story to be like number 20, like a lot of the like beginning and end of each set is, is pretty planned. Like the one at the end of this set. So like the one that came out today, which is number 20, um, like that story I knew I wanted to be number 20. So, um, it was a matter of like working everything, uh, around that number. So there are some stories where it's like, I'll, I'll have my outline and I'll have a blank spot and I'll, I'll literally just come up with like something like this, where it's just like about a baker in midport, um, and just kind of like throw that in and then write that and then, you know, see how that goes. Um, but now I think like, as we're building the world more and I'm focusing on it a lot more than I was at the beginning. I feel that a lot of the ideas are getting fleshed out ahead of time now, uh, but it wasn't really that way in the beginning. So like I have planned most of the stories between now and 50 and a lot of the stories post 50 because um, of how I had to like move and condense things down. But, um, but at the beginning, it was a lot of just kind of winging it or just filling in gaps and stuff. So uh, it's a little bit of both. And, it's, and it continues to be a little bit of both, but uh, I think I'm a little more structured and my outline is a lot more solid now than it was at the beginning, which makes sense. Like as we go, I'm just kind of figuring things out. But uh, this next one is about a record keeper. I will explain more of what that means after we listen to it. Uh, it's by our good friend Cecilia, aka uh, Sassy, and she also did an amazing job. Uh, and uh, we'll take a listen to this and then I'll explain more about it after. Um, because the record keeper story is a little complicated, but uh, very interesting. So we'll we'll talk more about it after. But. You'll get the gist of it from the story, and then I'll just explain what certain things mean. But uh, let's take a listen. One might ask how I got to where I am in my life, but to fully understand, you must first know that my lifespan is far greater than the average. Actually, if I'm being honest, as of this moment, it is never ending. My name is Ilia, and I have been chosen by a being far superior to any of us to keep track of records that cover the majority of our known universe, and sometimes, even the unknown. To accomplish this task, I need to be in a position where I can worry not about the basic trivial human functions, and instead dedicate myself wholeheartedly to what I do. In order to keep track of these things, I can't do it all on my own. As much as I wish I could solely serve my master, there are others like me. The nice thing about this job, though, is that we're allowed to choose where we spend most of our time. While Earth is popular and Ronka is interesting, there was one planet I was fascinated by from its very beginning, the one I call home now, Fenrir. The origins of Fenrir itself, as in the planet, could be broken down scientifically. An astrophysicist might tell you it was formed through accretion, but an immortal record keeper like myself would tell you that this was no scientific formation. Instead, it was a piece of matter given spark by a godly being with a big imagination. Molded, handcrafted, and given life with this being's own breath and love. Once the base was formed, the terrain was sculpted and four seeds were planted. In the west, a red seed that would grow and sprout a mighty god with claws and fangs. To the east, a goddess emerged from a blue seed and flew high in the air before crashing into the waters below. The northern green seed created the mold for which Fenins, or this world's humans, would take shape. Though this god in particular was more elf than man. And the southern grey seed would give way to Fenrir's greatest terrors. Of course I speak of this world's gods and goddesses, but I have to make it dramatic and give it some flair, right? 
Mr. Claws and Fangs is in Roar, the wolf god, often associated with war and battle. The beauty in the east is Morska, a mermaid, though she can take on many other forms. In the north, Jakari, the elf god. Bounty and harvest are his forte, but he is also big on culture and celebration. Lastly is Aradia, the witch goddess. Even as a record keeper, I can't say I know much about her. The bog is scary, and I recommend not going there if you can avoid it. You know, all this reminiscing reminds me of a story about four more entities on Fenrir that correlate to the gods and goddesses. We might as well talk about this as well, since they are just as important to the history of Fenrir as its deities. As the world began to take shape and became inhabited with Fenins, the gods and goddesses continued to rise in power. They became symbols and integrated themselves into the daily lives of those around them. As their popularity and strength grew, so did their reach and scope. Soon, they were aware of each other. In many cases, this led to prosperity for the people of Fenrir, but in other instances, this caused a lot of hardships. Jakari thought himself the most loved, Enror thought himself the most feared, and Morska thought herself the most respected. Though fear, and maybe even to a degree, respect as well, was probably reserved for Aradia. No one really knew what she thought or felt, because she was the least involved of them all. One day, when the gods and goddesses were their most divided, it was up to their loyal followers to mend the wounds. A prophet, respected by the deities, reached out to them individually and offered an item that would bring peace back to Fenrir. That prophet was Wince, and how he came to obtain this item is still a mystery to all of those who study the lore of the planet. The gift he offered was a large metal box, and he brought it to an empty temple in Beruva. This temple was used by the deities to meet before, and it seemed a fitting place to gather them. Wince arrived first, unsure if the gods and goddesses would reveal themselves to him, and placed the gift upon a pedestal in the middle of the temple. As if appearing from thin air, the large and roar showed himself first. Morska arrived next, taking on a human form, and then Jakari. They all stood in silence, awaiting the arrival of Aradia, and just as Jakari was about to suggest that she would not show, the grotesque Lady of the Bog emerged from a shadowy puddle on the ground. Wince had been visited by some of the deities before, but never all at once. This situation left him overwhelmed, and he struggled to find resolve. Mostly wanting to get this over with, but also trying to keep up appearances, Jakari waved his hand and presented Wince with a flower. While you hold this, you will find your poise and confidence, Jakari told Wince with a smile. Wince accepted the gesture and took a deep breath. I present to you a magical item most rare, Wince said with a bow. The gift of Anara, a single sacrifice of thyself placed inside the box will return a more powerful upgrade, the likes of which even a deity has never seen or experienced. However, I should explain that these things quite often had a catch. The reward will only be granted if all four of you make the sacrifice. The deities hesitated, and after much deliberation, Morska made up their minds for them. Though in human form, she reached deep inside her own thigh and revealed one of her many scales. She placed the scale inside the box. Morska's body was covered in scales, as it is, and she played it safe with this sacrifice, though she hoped for a stronger body as a result. And Roar broke off one of his many large, sharp nails and threw the broken piece into the box. If the prophet was speaking true, then Enroar hoped for even deadlier claws to strike down his enemies. Perhaps even claws strong enough to strike down the gods and goddesses around him. Plus, he had many claws and this sacrifice would not harm him. Aradia was a unique creature compared to the others. She had an ability much like Morska's that allowed her to transform her appearance, but by default she took on a form that was half woman and half snake with many tentacles protruding out of her back and shoulders. Aradia removed one of the tentacles and added it to the box. Another safe sacrifice that Aradia hoped would improve the length of her extra appendages. Not to be outdone, and not to play it safe as the others, Jakari removed a blade from his person and slowly carved out one of his eyes. He looked at the other deities with his remaining eye, as if to flex his superiority to them as he placed his eye within the box. Wince moved to the center and placed the top of the box back on. The moment he did, a loud click noise echoed through the temple, and the box began to glow. A bright white blast shot out of the box and passed through Wince as well as the deities. Wince stood there. A sudden fear overcame him. He had no recollection of what he had done or where he had been. Terrified, he looked around the room at the deities. 
Wince's eyes locked with a crushed claw, a missing scale, a severed tentacle, and a hole in Jakari's face where his eye had once been. You lied! Jakari yelled while covering his face. Vines emerged from the ground and surrounded him, and when they vanished, so did he. Upset and frustrated, Morska vanished in a cloud of blue smoke. Wince fell to the ground scared and unaware of what he had done. Someone had tricked him, or controlled him, he wasn't really sure. But when he looked up, Enroar had also disappeared, and that was only him and Aradia. Though the floor was now covered in corrupted shadows once again, Aradia didn't leave, and poor Wince was never heard from again. So what did the sacrifices to the gift of Anara actually do? Well, nothing at first. The deities understood that they had been fooled, but also knew it wasn't Wince's doing. So they set out to find the one who tricked them, but had very little success. Unfortunately, none of them thought to move or hide the box, and an ill-fated adventurer one day opened it in Pandora-like fashion. From the box emerged four legendary creatures unlike any seen on Fenrir before. I, uh, I know I say this about like every single one we listen to, but... One of my favorite ones, like, honestly, like, Sassy did an amazing job. It was a really good one for her first one. Uh, but, like, this story in specific, I actually really, really like. And, like, Jake just put in chat, it has one of the best lines in any fantasy distraction of Sassy just going, You lied! <laughs> I want to make that a notification so bad. Actually, um... I might have to cha change my follow notification based on what Jake and I were talking about yesterday um, because uh, I don't know if I want to use my current follow one in spite of recent events. I don't really even want to talk about it on this video because it'll live on forever in this video if I talk about it, but I might have to change my follow notification. I might change it to uh, not, not you lied, but uh, I stood there in awe. <laughs> I might change it to that, but yeah, the, uh, you lied! I love it so much. Her voiceover gives me such Katara vibes. What is Katara from? Am I, am I too dumb for this one? Um, but yeah, she, she's amazing. Sassy did so good. Definitely go check out her stream, but the story itself is, um, is big. It's like very important on so many different levels and so many different scales, right? So, uh, haha, Morska referenced. Um, so she's a record keeper, which is a immortal being that keeps track of a planet. It doesn't necessarily have to be Fenrir. Um, for another godlike of being, um, that we haven't quite introduced yet, but it is the the creator of Fenrir, as well as some other things within the universe. Um, and this, this godlike being makes Fenrir, and she, or he, it is a she, but I'll just say she, uh, she wants to keep tabs on it because she really likes Fenrir as a planet. So she creates these record keepers that are immortal, and um, they keep track of it for her. Uh, and kind of just like report back to her when certain things are happening. Um, there's a lot of things to dissect in this one. Um, like the fact that the record keepers also don't really know a lot about Aradia. Like they're also kind of afraid of her and don't want to travel into the bog, which uh, we, we learned about with number 10, uh, which we covered in the last recap stream. But um, the bog and the, the deadlands, which are like part they're like kind of connected, um, is where Aradia like dwells and people that go in there never come out. And there's not a lot known about Aradia as well as the place that she lives in. So um, the fact that also these like immortal record keepers are afraid to go in there too um, is, is, is very important. Uh, Katara is from Avatar The Last Airbender. Ah, uh, gotcha, okay. Got a similar sound. It was great. I got to. Uh, I got to watch that. So I never watched that. I really wanted to watch the Legend of Korra, and then I never did. Uh, I'll have to. I'll have to watch that at some point. But 
but yeah, um, Sassy did awesome, and uh, I just keep squeezing that in there. But um, then on top of that, we get introduced to the gods and goddesses a little bit more, um, like on a personal level, and the fact that like we learned that Chikari's kind of a jerk, and he's like super cocky and confident, and he thinks everybody loves him, uh, whereas the other gods are like, come on, dude. And then... Uh, uh, Enroar is is the god of like war and battle. So like Enroar is low key like kind of trying to figure out a way that he could kill the other gods because he wants to be the only god. Uh, and you and you get that bit of information as well, which is kind of interesting. Um, Morska is a bit more of like a neutral party kind of, uh, especially like in these meetings where all of the gods are together and. Um, but at the same time, she's also, like, the first one to sacrifice something, so she gets the ball rolling on this. And then uh, Aradia is just kind of, like, there, but she doesn't really uh, show up often for a lot of these things. And she's she's the least, um, like, uh, prevalent god, I guess. Like, she, she isn't really around often, and she doesn't present herself to people often. So, um there's very little known about her and she's just not really around um uh, but she did show up to this and uh they're summoned there by this prophet dude named wince uh who is tricked into bringing them a box of magic that they sacrifice peace themselves into and the result are these four legendary monsters based off of what they put in uh and we get to see those monsters uh, eventually um, as time goes on, uh, they will be uh, given stories that either are specifically about them or they're included in other stories. But uh, it's also important to know that a lot of a lot more of the like present day stuff, um, those monsters are either missing or gone. In the same way that like the gods and goddesses are kind of missing and gone as well, in like the present day stories, which is going to be mentioned in the very next story with King Ingvar. Um, but it's just like there's so many I, I wanted this story specifically to leave a lot of questions and uh you come out of it wondering like who set them up uh what are what are these monsters where did the box come from uh who is anara because it's the the gift of anara is the name of the box that the guy gives the gods and goddesses um who set wince up for this um obviously Aradia murders him at the end, but um, um, you know, like, did the gods and goddesses ever find the one responsible for this? Um, as well as a lot of questions about the person uh, who created, or or the god, I should say, that created Fenrir in general. So there, there's a lot to um, uh, take in from this story, and a lot of it leaves a lot more questions than answers. But uh, I, I think this was a good kind of like tease for a lot of things that are coming up. So um, that's kind of what this story is, is about. It's kind of just teasing and setting up a lot of things that we're going we're gonna to dissect a bit more later on. Um, all right. So the next one is King Ingvar. I also love the way Sassy says King Ingvar in, in that one too. <laughs> I don't know why I like the way she says it in that one. But but you you lied takes the cake for me. You lied. I got to make that a notification on my stream. Um, I still don't really know. I don't even remember if I set up notifications for YouTube. I don't think so. Because I think I got a subscriber during the stream so far and nothing popped up. Uh, I think maybe the only thing that might pop up is like... Uh, Donation? I don't know. I honestly don't know because uh, I might have just turned notifications off so they don't pop up while we're watching videos, but I honestly don't remember. And I don't know what I'm doing on YouTube as far as streaming goes. So I'm winging it 99% of the time. Anyway. I remember one. sitting. Oh my god, Jake. That scared me, even though I knew it was going to pop up. Um. Getting scared by my own YouTube videos. Uh that I, I am purpose 
purposely playing. Uh, so this one's going to be about King Ingvar. We'll listen to this one. We'll talk about it. We'll get Jake back in if he's still around and watching. And, uh, and we'll talk about it. But uh, let's listen to it first. This one's really good. I mean, I say that about all of them, but I kind of have to. They're my babies. But they are really good, and I love them. All right. Enjoy. I remember sitting in a tavern in Truscan months after the fight on top of Shaer. For those less informed, the mountain of Shaer was the stage set by the gods for the most legendary battle in the history of Fenrir. Lord Kazai versus King Ingvar. As I sat in this tavern and enjoyed my drink, I noticed on this particular night that the establishment was lacking in patrons. There was only one table occupied besides the one I was sitting at, and it was full of obsidian knights, King Ingvar's men. I quietly listened to their conversations, and was not surprised at all that the topic of conversation was their king. You would assume people in the West would have grown to hate Ingvar by now. He was a violent tyrant, hell-bent on achieving his goals by any means necessary, and his main goal was defeating Lord Kazai once and for all. While Lord Kazai would inspire his men, make sure they were well taken care of and his land was prosperous, King Ingvar would just as easily sacrifice one of his men or an entire village if it meant gaining the upper hand on Lord Kazai. These men, these obsidian knights, were no exception. If anything, he was the most ruthless towards them because his expectations of his own army were high. Yet they sat there and bragged and boasted about their fearless leader. Despite his aggression, it was hard to deny the legend. He had many flaws, but the people of the West rallied behind their new leader, King Wellick who ruled before Ingvar, was a man of politics. While he feuded with Lord Unden in a similar fashion, the two had never fought in one-on-one -on -one combat, the premise for which Kazai and Ingvar's rivalry was born. Many people have their own tales about the battle, the truth being that only Ingvar or Kazai could really know how everything went down, but the stories about the world changing are indeed accurate. Even if the physical changes to Fenrir were coincidence, there was a change in the atmosphere as well. You could tell that when those two men returned, this world we knew would never be the same. Their weapons tore the sky apart and the heavens bled, said one scribe. A bit dramatic, if you ask me, but... There was a bizarre blood rain in some parts of Fenrir during the battle. The fire in Lord Kazai and the rage in King Ingvar rivaled that of the great volcano in Amir, so much so that the volcano erupted in fear, wrote another, and it's hard to argue with the facts. The volcano in Amir erupted during the battle. It makes you wonder what was so special about this showdown that the world itself watched and reacted the way that it did. Tired of King Ingvar's endless praise from these knights, I tried to ignore them. But as the only table with guests in the whole tavern, it was hard to ignore their gloating. Luckily, they switched to a topic I rather do enjoy when discussing this rivalry. The weapons themselves. Lord Kazai wielded Rednefed, a katana given to him by Lord Unden that is said to be able to block any attack. King Wellick gave a similar katana to King Ingvar before the battle, Cold Knight. The weapon's name itself has its own stories, but Cold Knight was Rednefed's opposite, a blade said to cut through anything. Anything but Kazai's blade, apparently, and thus the stalemate. A sword that can cut anything against a blade that can block any attack. I do wish I was up there to see how the battle ended. Did both men become tired and pass out? Did they agree to try another day? Knowing both of their personalities, it's hard to see either one just quitting or them both agreeing to quit. I'm shocked. They're not both still up there fighting until they both die of old age. 
Judging by how the world changed, I'm not sure Fenrir would have survived that. Then the knights touched on a story I've heard almost as much as the stories about the battle itself. The day that Ingvar denounced Inror, the wolf god of war and battle. Some of what they talked about was shockingly accurate, but some was a bit off. This is a topic that I could speak upon in great detail. Mere weeks after their battle, Ingvar found himself in the town of Genin, a town known to be protected by Inror, and where the wolf god's most devout followers called home. I remember it very clearly. I was there. I was one of them. Ingvar entered Genin with his knights, the newly declared King of the West. Ingvar was the largest man I had ever seen, with muscles in places I didn't know could have muscles. He looked more like a Viking than a samurai, but if you didn't know the man, you would think he was one of Lord Kazai's soldiers. Cold Knight was a perfect katana with a black hilt and a dark blue blade. Ingvar wore fur on his upper body that barely covered his skin, and despite how cold it was that day in Genin, you would think it was a midsummer day looking at him. I sat in front of a statue meant to honor Inroar, praying with my brethren. We spent almost every day kneeling down in front of this statue. I will never forget the sound it made when one of Ingvar's knights kicked it over and it shattered on the ground before me. I went to grab the pieces, but my friend next to me grabbed my wrist to stop me. I looked up at the knight who did it and could tell he was laughing under his helmet. What happened next, I remember very vividly. Ingvar walked to the front of our group and looked around. He could have slaughtered us with ease. Instead, he spoke. Here, I have lived on Fenrir for many years. Here, I have heard the tales of gods and goddesses. Mermaids and witches, elves and wolves. Where are they now? This one, this wolf, claims to be the god of war and battle. You worship him. Yet how many wars and battles have you seen him fight? Have you ever seen him at all? Look upon me with your own eyes. Here I stand before you, made of flesh and blood, he who changed the world. Not just your landscapes or your towns, not the social structure or means in which you make a living, but also your minds, the way you think, the very way you view this world. I will stop at nothing to kill my enemies, your enemies and I will gladly do it with my own hands. Praise this wolf no longer, for I am your god now. This one's pretty intense. <laughs> the end of this one is so intense. It's so good, man. Dude, I, I think this is the one that Jake recorded at like 3 in the morning and he was like dead tired and he still did better than like, I, I think like 90% of voice actors do in their like time frame that they're comfortable with. My goodness. Jake's amazing, dude. But yeah, like King Ingvar, I, I don't even remember. He wasn't even supposed to be called Ingvar. Like I, uh, I took a while to brainstorm his name. I, I was thinking about this when I was listening to that one. Uh, he almost wasn't King Ingvar. He was almost something else. But I, I can't even remember what the something else was. Because Ingvar is just like, I, I love the name a lot. I'm, I'm happy that we landed on Ingvar and Kazai. But... Derpy, what's up, man? Monkey. 
<laughs> oh, it was 4 a.m., my bad. Uh, which was 5 a.m., my bad. Derpy, how's it going, man? We got one read by Derpy coming up at the end, so stay tuned for that. But, um, yeah, so we, uh, we did this one, and, uh, I think it's very interesting. Like, making up the stories around the person narrating is almost as fun as making up the story that it's connected to. Excuse me. Because, like, for this one, we came up, I, I came up with a guy that's, like, sitting in a bar just trying to, like, enjoy his evening. And the only table that has people are just talking about, like, a topic he does not want to even think about. Because, like, when you think about it, like, this guy was a worshiper of Enru. And, like, <laughs> Ingvar just comes into town and, and denounces his god in front of him. And, like, could have killed him. So it's, uh, it's interesting to see, like, um, what, what we come up with as far as the person that's narrating. Almost as much as it's interesting to hear the story. And uh, and you get these like bits and pieces of like Ingvar's story and Kazai's story from like all these different people that are kind of living like around them, and it's uh, it's pretty interesting. I think. Yo, Blue Wolf, what's up, man? How's it going? Do I do I call you Blue? Do I call you Wolf? We're talking about a Wolf God right now. He's not Blue though. At least I don't picture him to be Blue. I don't know. I guess he could be Blue. Um, good. I'm excited. Nice. Yeah, we, uh, should I just, Jake, do you want to, do you want to comment on this again? Or no? But, um, yeah, like, I, I just really enjoy Ingvar and Kazai's whole dynamic and their story. Um, I've, I've told this story on stream. Um, I believe I spoke about it in the last recap stream as well. But, um, but Ingvar's sword is based on 10,000 cold knights, um, which is why I say, like, you know, his weapon has its own stories. But I, I don't know if we'll ever deep dive into, like, where those weapons come from. I guess that could be a pretty interesting little uh, side project thing if we wanted to do it uh, for fantasy, fantasy distractions, maybe uh, explain, like, the blacksmiths that created cold knight and uh, Rendefed and why they have powers and stuff. I think that could be fun too. Maybe we'll explore that at some point if we're looking for some gap fillers or, uh, you know, we just want to do something a little different. Um, so that's that's another option that we could do at some point down the line. But uh, for now, it'll just be another one of those fun little mysteries that we got going on. Um, if that, yeah, was to talk about the... Gonna hop in and BRB. Okay. Hello. Hello. I will be right back because, like, you just hopped in right as my pizza was about to be done. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's pizza. Course. Sounds good yeah, right now, though. So, BRB. Um, just chill until I pass out. Nice. I, uh, we are coming up on your first ones soon blue wolf that is number 18 so we're coming up to that one good stories to vibe to yeah it's um it's pretty fun doing these recap streams because i i listen to them obviously like while i'm making them and when i upload them but i feel like when i listen to them during the recap stream that I do better with the background music than I thought. Like that Ingvar background music is amazing. If we if we ever get to turn this into like an anthology TV series, which is kind of what I want to do, uh, I'm gonna see what it takes to get that song as like Ingvar's theme in the show. Because uh, that music I really like. Maybe maybe not necessarily for Ingvar, but that background song for that one is really good. Um, I'm gonna wait for Jake to come back, and we'll we'll chat a little bit about Ingvar, his thoughts on it, and then uh, move on to number sixteen, which is Charlemagne. And um, there's there's quite a few fun ones in this set, you know. Like we we got 
We got Derpy returning. We got Jake returning for a couple. We have uh, the introduction of Sassy and Blue Wolf. Um, what else do we got? What's in between? Uh, we got Zaf doing another one. So, like, this is a pretty solid set, and I and I think it's only gonna get better from here as we uh, we kind of like figure out who to put where and uh, what stories to so uh, put people on, and I think it's gonna be. It'd be really fun figuring that out as fun uh fun little pizza story okay uh, for christmas my parents got me like a brand new really nice pizza cutter okay which i thought was hilarious right that you know i became the pizza king in june and they were like let's get him a, a pizza cutter like his very <laughs> own so i have this really really nice like stainless steel pizza cutter now well when you're the king you gotta have the tools you know yeah yeah it's really good it's really nice so anyway that's awesome yeah i love pizza me too man. what kind I of pizza you are you too. eating right now these are the important pepperoni questions. Uh, so Ingvar, I know, I know that's your boy, your boy yeah. Ingvar. I vividly remember recording this one. Yeah, because it was four in the morning. It was four in the morning. Yep. It was. But I mean, like, dude, if you didn't tell me that, I wouldn't have even been able to tell. <laughs> like, you crushed it. I thank you. I I felt kind of bad about getting it to you at four in the morning, especially because I was like, I gotta do an Ingvar voice, <laughs> and. I can't be loud. No, I came out again. Yeah. If I if if I could do it again, the thing I would change is I'd record it earlier, obviously. And I'd probably give Ingvar more of like a booming, like a little booming more yeah. like to the front, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. But well, this is very early on in uh like his reign, I guess. So I mean you're you're obviously gonna be voicing him again at some point. So yeah. I mean, next time you voice him, you could give him more of like a boom and and uh hashtag dingvar for life oh god <laughs> the, the the next recap stream will have dingvar in it so look yeah. forward to that but um yeah like uh the next time you voice him you could you could give him more of like a booming voice and it wouldn't necessarily oh, yeah. be like why didn't he sound like this before it would be more like you know he's more like seasoned in brain mm -hmm. Why didn't he sound like this before? Because I recorded it at 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll just link long. people to this recap stream and just be like, he recorded it at 4 a.m. That's yeah. why we spoke about this. Um, go, go to an hour and 50 minutes and you'll find out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Ingvar and Kazai are definitely kind of like the anchors of the story right now, uh, where it'll probably eventually end up being more like like Jack and Anna are the anchors at some point, but I I think like Ingmar and Kazai will always be relevant, and they'll always kind of be like this overshadowing uh, theme that we have going on because they're <laughs> they're so important to the story. Well, this is really funny because the first one I read for you was the Kazai one, right? And I was like, okay, yeah, these two are like rivals and they rule their own side of the world and stuff and probably they're they're in like conflict and whatnot but i didn't expect it to be like a full-on war that kind of encompasses the whole world yeah so like and, and i like i thought i was just gonna it's like this is the one time kazai gets talked about unless there's one to, like <laughs> talking about ingbar it's like no these guys are always relevant yeah <laughs> and like which i was not at all ready for yeah, and so. uh, what I love about it is like uh, the story that that Blue Wolf did um, takes place on like a separate continent that's like a bit more north of like where this war is happening. But like even they know about it, and like yeah. it can't be easy to like for news to travel in this medieval setting. So it's yeah. like even these people up north are like, you know, there's wars raging in the south, but you know, here we are, kind of, and it's like, everybody just kind of knows about it. It's this, like, worldwide... Yeah, it's huge. I hate to use, like, phenomenon because it's not really, you know, like, you say that about, like, Justin Bieber, you don't really say that about war, <laughs> but, but, like, I, uh, I, I don't know, I just like that idea, that it's, like, it's such a big deal across yeah. the entire world that, like, everybody references. Yeah. 
it's a, it's it's definitely like I should have known that that it was gonna be more than I thought because it's like Kazai, he who shook the world, yeah. you know, and it's like this has got to be big, but at the same time, it could be that exaggeration and the whole like no one knows what happened on that mountain, and yeah. I was like this is a cool, neat little story. I'm kind of sad that this is probably going to be the only one. And now it's like, hey, Jake, there's like a whole war that's going to go on that focuses on Kazai and Ingvar yeah. the whole time. Like, I kind of made you play both of them. So, you know, the, the, when when like a Kazai-Ingvar story comes out where they talk to each other, I get to talk to myself, which yeah, is always great. great. <laughs> It'd be great. So, I am... Um... Um, the other thing is like I had mentioned earlier about the blocks and stuff because I think mm -hmm. I don't think I I had that idea when we did the last recap stream, but um so like the next block is literally wartime. So it's like the next block is gonna be a lot of Ingvar and Kaza oh, yeah. and, and a lot of like what's going on in the world and around them. So that that should be a lot of fun to play with because we'll mm -hmm. be we'll be exploring that like very like thoroughly. It'll be a lot of fun just to see like where things kind of end up and lie in that specific block, I guess. It, it'll, yeah. be, it'll be interesting. It, you definitely have not heard the last of these two. Uh, you're oh, kind of yeah. just hearing the beginning of it, to be honest. Yeah. But uh, I mean, have, have we hit a point where you would be able to actually pick which one you prefer? You feel like you'd be betraying something if you did? No, I mean, I feel like it wouldn't be fair for me to pick one primarily because there's really only been the one story about Kazai. Yeah. And like we've, we've, Kazai has not been fleshed out as much as Ingvar. Like Kazai's, yes, talked about Kazai and how he and Ingvar got their titles, but I feel like that was more, that story was more of a setup of both Kazai and Ingvar, yeah. instead of just like, this is Kazai. Yes, it focused on Kazai, but it told us what we needed to about the both of them. And then Ingvar's, right now, actually was like a, a story fleshing out his character. Yeah. Kazai's character hasn't been fleshed out a whole lot recently, like and, that, that I've seen. And you that know? kind of continues in the next set too, because I mean, I mean, you've been helping me write them on Twitch, but like, yeah. um, we we do a lot more Ingvar stories in the next set than we do Kazai. Yeah. But the the set after that will we'll be, be will be a little yeah. more about Kazai. But you you kind of get like bits and pieces of his character, um, in other stories in the sense that mm -hmm. like. You know, he, well, the uh, way that people talk about him is right. very much like it's 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 very established. Like it, the world, at least, tends to think that Kazai is the good guy and Ingvar right. is the bad guy. Um, at least that's how they've been like characterized by the people telling the stories. Right. Um, whereas I know I've talked to you about stuff like I've I've got some of the insider details. That's right. But um, you know, I know that. Ingvar isn't like a terrible person. And I know that Kazai isn't like squeaky clean either. Right. Um which is a good thing. I think that's a good thing, especially for like a war story, you know. But um I would say that I lean more towards Ingvar at this point just because I know that much more about him. Yeah. And I'm intrigued to know more about him, uh, like how he actually is versus how the public perceives him. And I also just have a feeling that like Kazai isn't going to be revealed to be like actually just a trash human being. So it's like the perception of these characters from the people is probably close to accurate, but they're more accurate with Kazai than they are with Ingvar. Yeah. Like it's kind of like this general idea that, um, you know, Kazai is like the more honorable or the more efficient ruler. And yeah. Ingvar is more of like, you know, if they go to war, he's probably more prepared for actual battle than like Kazai's mm -hmm. entire army. So like, it's going to be interesting, that whole dynamic, because um, it's almost going to feel like, like the people of Fenrir want Kazai to win, probably. But they don't think he's going to. So there's yeah. a lot of like like Kazai is a ruler. Yeah. And Ingvar is a warrior. Right. That is in a ruler position. 
Yeah, and like they both so. kind of start off as warriors, but then mm -hmm. once they're given these like positions of power, like Kazai probably had more of a like um, easier role transition. model, I guess, like in the sense. Um, yeah. Even though Unden kind of seems like a jerk, but at the same time, it's like these guys are at the tail end of their lives trying to end this rivalry. So, mm -hmm. like, they've kind of gone mad, but you don't really know what Unden was like before <laughs> that. You know, like, he, he could have, like, took Kazai under his wing and, and trained him for, like, this moment, uh, yeah. whether he meant to or not. Um, yeah. And Ingvar is probably just, like, Ingvar's my top guy because he's my top guy. Like, he, he's the best warrior. Yeah. Yeah, I... I feel once we get uh, to the start of the war, once yeah. once this first block is finished, I'll be able to give you a better uh, yeah that's a, a set in stone answer of who who I uh, who yeah, I yeah we'll to. have this conversation probably a lot over the course of the the next couple of uh, sets I should say I can't even say the next couple of weeks because these are ten weeks apart which is wild yeah. Um, Derpy said he's haunted by an apparition that I do not know. Are you talking about Dingvar? No, that's... Well, probably, but also <laughs> that's just a normal thing for him. Um, you don't like to listen to your own recordings, correct? Um, I don't like listening back to them when I'm about to send them to you. Um, it, It's a different feeling. Granted, there's there's a big difference between listening to my narration recordings uh and listening to like a fan dub or something that i've done right right because with a fan dub what i'm saying is going to be put to a scene that's animated and like it'll look like a character is talking that's just voiced by me um so narration is still a little like meh i don't care to go back and listen to my own things but um I do get to, you know, I will go back and listen to them because one, I enjoy the story. And two, it it's like the finished product. Listening to the finished product is is like kind of that dopamine rush of like, man, I did this. I'm in this. So you but uh, like so you have listened to this one back. Yes. Okay. I love the way you say Viking in that one part. <laughs> That's where I was going with this. <laughs> How exactly did I say it? Let me find it. You said he's more of like a like a Viking than a samurai, but I don't know. The way you say Viking is like one of my favorite things. Uh, I don't know where. He looked more like a Viking. <laughs> yeah, like that. It's at five forty. <laughs> Interesting. Again, stream. I don't know. I love it. Five forty is it? I it's like five. It ends at five forty. So like five thirty like eight. -ish. I don't know why I like it so much. I had ever seen, with muscles in places I didn't know could have I muscles. Find it, like I, I think one of my favorite. He looked things more is like a Viking. Your reaction to, like how I say things, because they're like I stood there in awe, oh. <laughs> you know, like that's so funny to it's so it's it's funny to me to hear people pick out these like little things instead of just like the yeah. overall whatever yeah well i mean <laughs> like i don't know i guess it's because of more of like the uh the like streamer mentality i guess yeah i always try to like listen for things that would make funny like notifications <laughs> so so like when i hear specific things like you lied you lied. i'm like i kind of just wish i had this as a notification on my stream yeah yeah because i think well it's, it's so like funny. i i do the same thing with my music like there's sp tiny little things that last for like a second that i'm like this is the best part of the whole song yeah. this one second is the best part and it's like a laugh <laughs> yeah because i you mean know? like i do enjoy them like genuinely like for the most part from start to finish like i i love it like you know you guys are helping me out and i i really appreciate it and i just like I, I can't be picky really so i just like to just enjoy it and and i will say genuinely i have enjoyed all the ones that you guys have sent to me and it's like so at that point like i'll just be repeating myself like oh it's so good i love it you know like i do that anyway because i it's genuine but like when i find little things to pick out that i really enjoy 
uh that that's yeah. why like i kind of mentioned those to you guys because like they i just find so much enjoyment in them like how you say viking yeah. uh the i stood there in awe the you lied janine doing the like goblin the voice like yeah. there's so many things that i i really i yeah. mean ta and, and tamer I mean... in general is just yeah <laughs> hey that whole um, one is good i will say like as as a voice actor hearing that feedback on just the tiny little things is like so refreshing yeah I don't um, know, it's just what stands out to me yeah well that's like that's good because you know when i've submitted stuff to directors um they kind of just give me an overall like yeah this is good i like this and if they have notes it's primarily on things that they would want me to redo if they need me to redo anything right, right. um and when I've directed and, you know, helped people with stuff, uh, I try to like my best to point out, like, I really liked this. If I can point to any specific thing, just because I feel like that, that reinforcement there is, is a good way of, you know, communicating with, with your talent of like, I really liked this part. This was great. Um, and to me, it also was like a method of, telling someone like i listened to all of this i can point to a specific thing so like you know having you come in and be like bro the way you said viking was just <laughs> i don't know why i liked it but i liked it it's to me it's like nice like yeah. i'm i'm glad that that makes me happy because it means that you are paying attention for little things yeah i, um, I love stuff like that so yeah it's great it's it's fun you know there's so many things that i'm like like I thought about the uh, the you lied from Sassy, and I was like, should I get her to re-record re it so that it's, or should I like modify it so that it's not as loud? Is what I was thinking of, was of like just cutting that part and lowering the volume. And I was like, no, I love the fact that she yells it. <laughs> like like it's so much lo louder than everything else in that story. And I was like, I love, <laughs> I love every minute of it. Like I want, I want it to stay this way. Plus, it's such like a. It's almost like a like a whiny little like brat, like which is kind of like what Jakari is. Like he's kind of just like he thinks he's better than everybody. He's just so a spoiled little turd. Yeah, like if things don't go his way, he would totally be like, "You lied to me! <laughs> like how dare you!" <laughs> and I just I don't know. I love the way she delivers that so much. My every, every time I hear you me. lied, I think of that. Me too. Game Grumps story. Oh. You lied to me. Uh, that ties into why I think I'm probably going to change my follow notification on Twitch. No, uh, don't. To, uh, more more information came out of it. Yeah. If that's what you're worried about. Okay, good. Yeah. And it's it's not nearly as bad as people are saying it is. Right, good. It's heavily overreacted. I, anyway. um, I still might change it to uh, yeah, I fair. stood there. In, in awe. awe. <laughs> if you want, I can do like a really crappy acapella recording of Glorious, like purposefully <laughs> like terrible. If you want, if you want that for sub sounds. I should I don't know how to set it up, but like isn't there a way that you could have like multiple notifications for one thing? I think so. I'm gonna see if I could do that. It would be cool if I could have like a 10% chance. <laughs> <laughs> that if you subscribe to me it's just you singing glorious <laughs> glorious no i won't give in i won't give in and it's like the really crappy like there's a higher pitch trying to harmonize and it's just garbage oh my god that'd be incredible. <laughs> i'm gonna look into that maybe we'll make that happen that'd be so funny because every once in a while that i'd feel really bad for like people that don't always sub to me and it's just like one random dude and he just gets that one <laughs> that'd be so funny uh they just be like this is his sub alert like what um no it's not dude when someone gives you like 10 subs glorious plays like seven times and then all of a sudden mine just shows up <laughs> once <laughs> like right in the middle or, or right at the end It'd be fantastic <laughs> <laughs> uh all right well let's uh wait, did you have anything else for anymore uh not not really I mean, I just, I remember recording that one because I was so tired. Yeah. So good, man. The Yingvar and Kaze stuff, we'll definitely explore more. Um, Their reference, 
in like almost every story now, but they're referenced in a couple of these coming up. But, yeah. uh, but I mean, I, they're referenced in the one I wrote. <laughs> right. So they're like, um, I think they're m more so referenced in the next set than they are in the final four of this set. But okay. uh, but they are still kind of brought up here and there. Or at least the the war itself is brought up a couple times. But um Yeah. We're gonna hop into well, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave my call with you, Jake. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I love All you. good. I love you too. Uh, <laughs> my man. <laughs> my man. Thank you for coming on and uh and providing some input. Uh, yep. This won't be the last time that you do this. <laughs> so, yep. <laughs> uh, so people get used to hearing this man's voice in more oh, ways well. than one. <laughs> we'll catch you later, Jake. Yeah, yeah man. Follow this man yeah. on Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> I cut it off right as he was doing the 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 deep <laughs> laugh. All right. Um. I think it's safe to remove my little microphone thingy. How I just pulled out some of my hair. It's fine. Um, all right, so we're gonna jump into number sixteen, which is Charlemagne. Um, the name is li like I literally just wanted to do a Charlemagne like play on, but like a female version, and I really wanted to do a pirate story. And uh, this ties back into Aliana, which was the first one that Janine read for us uh, back in the first set. So uh, let's just jump into it and then I'll talk more about it after. Fenrir is made up of many different continents, some of which feel as if they are ever expanding and growing. It feels like every year we find a new continent and more world to explore. But interlocking these continents are very large bodies of water that we have learned to generalize as the Fen Seas. Sure, there are subsections of the sea, but the generalization is necessary for simplicity's sake on our ever-expanding world. Some waters are cleaner and fresher than others, some are full of fish like the waters around Vorpal, and some areas of the Fen Seas are best left alone. Most particularly, the water around the bog to the south. Mucky black water that oozes into the harsh, swamp-like texture of the bog, and is surrounded by smoke and smog makes for much less ideal traversing. Then you have the complications that come with navigating some of the cleaner parts of the Fen Seas. The waters to the west, just outside King Ingvar's territories, are often violent and raging, much like their ruler. In other parts, both north and east, you have what many claim is the biggest problem of all. Pirates. As I mentioned, this world is ever-growing and expanding in ways no one can really explain, and often sea trade and exploration is the only way to find out about these new areas. Common folk aren't the only ones who know about this, and pirates wait for these new territories to emerge so they can take advantage of the weak. One of the lesser-known pirates is Charlemagne, who is often found near Vesuva. Compared to the other pirates roaming the Fen Seas, Charlemagne does things her own way and doesn't care too much about endless riches, but instead values the quality of them. Actually, if we're being technical, Charlemagne is obsessed with beautiful things and pretty picky on what she tries to hunt for. This makes it hard for her to recruit pirates to her fleet, but she does have quite a few loyal followers that probably just follow her because of how she presents herself. Charlemagne isn't what you would expect from her kind. She's rather clean, presents herself in an orderly fashion, and has rather high values and standards for a pirate. Sure, she wears an eye patch and a fancy hat, but I'm convinced it's just for show. I've actually had the privilege of talking to Charlemagne on occasion in a bar here in Vesuva. The last time we spoke, though, things seemed a bit off. Charlemagne wouldn't stop talking about her latest heist, a cave just outside Vesuva filled with treasure. She didn't go into the details of whose treasure it was or what happened to them, but she constantly spoke of a woman she met along the way. She was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen! Charlemagne exclaimed and proceeded to describe this woman in fine detail to me. Tall and skinny, with long, silk-like dirty blonde hair. Her eyes a fusion of the green on a summer field, the softest brown and the type of gold these pirates loved so much. If you've lived in Vesuva, then you know the beauty Charlemagne is referring to. Her name was Eliana. I explained the stories of this beauty to Charlemagne and asked when they looted this cave, to which Charlemagne replied that it had been some months prior and Charlemagne was looking for this woman ever since. 
I regretfully had to inform her that Eliana had not been seen in the port for quite some time, that Eliana's story was one of wanting more than life had to offer, a woman with a true yearning for adventure beyond the Sea of Asuba. In actuality, Eliana could be anywhere on Fenrir, or beyond by now. A lost beauty, Charlemagne said. It was almost as if I wasn't even sitting in front of her, like she was talking to herself. Wandering adrift on a distant shore, Charlemagne sighed and finally looked up at me. Very poetic, I replied. Whether she's right here on Fenrir or lost out there on the Fen Seas, I will find this beauty, Eliana. Charlemagne stood up with renewed purpose. She raised her hand and I noticed she had a small pendant with a chain attached to it clutched within. I will find her! This conversation I had with Charlemagne was months ago, which puts Eliana's disappearance at almost a year. Charlemagne never returned to Vesuva, at least not while I was at the bar, and I never found out if she found our sweet dear Eliana. Maybe she did. Charlemagne added that beauty to her ever-growing collection, or maybe they lived happily ever after. I do miss the tales of the beauty of Vesuva, and the story Charlemagne would tell me of her voyages. Someday, perhaps I'll learn what happened to them both. So I started, I started adding like a minute of the music at the end of a lot of these videos. I don't really know why, I just feel like it's better because it lets the ending screen pop up longer. Uh, so this was one of them. So this one's actually only about like four, like four minutes and 10 seconds long, uh, which is pretty short compared to some of the other ones around this, uh, around this one. But um, what I'm going to do now is I am going to just throw on some music and just run to the bathroom real quick because I've been drinking a lot of water. I try not to take breaks during these streams because I want it to be like one coherent thing on YouTube, but you got to go, you got to go, but I'll be right back real fast. Promise. back that was the um the background music for kazai um which is fantasy distraction number four by the way um so before we get into charlemagne um i just want to also make a note that i will update the description of this youtube um video when it when it gets uploaded to youtube uh with like everybody's links for like twitch and stuff like that for all the voice actors um all of the songs that are used are from Epidemic Sounds. I'll be including those in the description as well. Uh, and I'll update all of that most likely tonight, right after the stream's over. If not, definitely tomorrow morning, uh, first thing. But 
Um, so Charlemagne is interesting in the fact that it ties us back to Aliana, shows that she's still missing, uh, kind of teases a bit more of um, a story that I do want to do in the future of Eliana as a goblin, kind of like living the goblin life. Um, and we'll also like tie in uh, whether or not they actually do get uh, reunited. So, so Charlemagne is the pirate that Eliana meets in uh, all the way back in Fantasy Distraction number five. Um, so Eliana runs into this pirate in a cave, and it's kind of weird. Like, why didn't this pirate just kill her? You know, um, and uh, and this this is kind of why. Like, um, Charlemagne thought she was extremely beautiful, which she is. She is the beauty of Vesuva. Uh, and it's kind of like, like her beauty is known, like across the land, not necessarily like far and wide. Like, I don't think like it's as big of like a worldwide thing as, as like the war between Ingvar and Kazai is known everywhere. Like Jake and I were just talking about. I think it's more like, um, people in the vicinity and definitely in Vesuva know who she is. Um, and maybe like some people outside of Vesuva have heard of her, but it's mostly in Vesuva, like, people know about this girl. And, um, so, um, Charlemagne is obsessed with beautiful things, like, that, that's her thing. So, when she meets Eliana, she's like, wow, she's extremely beautiful. And it's, it's why, like, she doesn't just outright kill her or, you know, uh, something like that. And it's why, like, when they return to the path that they were on, um, and they they kind of look for her you know and it, it's kind of like this idea like why didn't charlemagne just like kidnap her or something because she's a pirate right then and there um but it's like it probably didn't really like hit her really until after like like oh i should like add this girl to my collection but i i don't think it's like that at all i think it's more of like a love interest kind of thing like she just thinks eliana is beautiful and uh like she kind of wants to court her i guess uh and that just like wasn't the right setting because they were robbing a cave uh after killing goblins so uh you know she probably figured like oh we'll run into this girl in town and i'll you know like i'll talk to her in town and uh they get back to town and obviously eliana's gone because eliana is now a goblin and um uh so then Charlemagne kind of becomes obsessed because she's obsessed with beautiful things so she starts looking for Eliana all over the Fen Seas and uh beyond so uh we will definitely come back to their story in some capacity uh probably after we do a story about Eliana as an actual goblin um and uh yeah the other thing that's interesting about this one is uh, my female pirate characters are typically very clean. Um, so, like, Mira, who is my cat girl pirate from A Soldier's Crest, the, uh, the book series that I write, um, when she meets the main character, Valak, um, he, he makes a very, like, specific note of, like, she's very, very clean, you know, like, she smells really good, uh, you know, her, she's got, like, her nails painted and stuff, like, she's, She's not what you would expect from a pirate. And, and that's kind of like what I picture for Charlemagne as well. Like she isn't your typical pirate, you know, like she's, she's very presentable. And, uh, but unlike Mira, where like everybody wants to follow Mira um, in a soldier's crest, like people are just drawn to her because she's very uh, charismatic. Um, pirates don't really want to follow Charlemagne because she's like, not your typical pirate. She doesn't really hunt the things that they normally hunt. Like she specifically chases after these beautiful things. And uh so like it actually like hurts her in the sense of being a pirate, but uh she doesn't really care. She just kind of does her own thing and people follow her cool. If not, then you know whatever. But uh but she's a really fun character and I and I definitely wanna uh bring her back into the mix later on at some point. Um, I actually thought the one that Blue Wolf did for us first was number 18, but it's actually this next one, number 17. So that means number 18 is the one that Zaf did for us. Uh, usually I'm pretty good with the numbers, so I'm kind of annoying myself for messing that up. So Blue Wolf is a... If you're not oops, tied up... Uh, voice actor... 
that can be found on YouTube as well as Twitter. Uh, he was talking in the chat earlier. So uh, at Blue Wolf underscore VA is his Twitter. I will link his YouTube in chat. Uh, if anybody wants to check that out, if anybody stumbles across this live stream at a later date, hopefully it pops up in chat for you. Um, I've already sent the wrong link once tonight. Uh, here's the link for his YouTube channel. Definitely go check him out. Uh, brand new voice actor for Fantasy Distractions. You will be hearing his voice again in the future. Um, or most likely number either 22 or 30, I think we're brainstorming. So uh, definitely go check him out and uh, look forward to hearing him again in the future. Uh, we'll listen to this story and then we'll talk about it after. So I'll just pop that on right now and uh, enjoy. If you're not tied up in the main conflicts of the world, then you most certainly have one thing in common with everyone else. You pray. You pray to something, someone, some otherworldly being. Something that by no means should exist inside the mortal world. The mermaid, the witch, the wolf, the elf, or whatever made them. You ask them for forgiveness. You ask them to show you the right path to walk in life. You pray for better days. Many people want the war to stop, but I'm afraid it's just beginning. News travels far and fast, and despite being way up here in the north, we know it's not getting much better in the south. And the further south you go, the worse it gets. Not to say we don't have our own problems up here. I grew up here in the snowy tundra known as Free Ratoa. The name was ironic because Ratoa was far from free. While most of my life was spent trying to survive the harsh weather of Ratoa, the people of this town had no idea that an army was amassing just outside our gates. It wasn't long before the tyrant came. Muda of Kabali was a ruthless leader, and his army was vast. I didn't even know that many people lived on this continent, but when they stormed Ratoa, it was obvious we stood no chance. Muda crushed this town and declared it free despite owning us as slaves. The torture our people endured over the next few months was brutal, and we found it hard to keep our faith. However, in our cells at night, there wasn't much else to do but pray. In order to respect each other and our diversity, in an effort to keep our humanity, we dedicated different nights to the four different gods and let those who believed in each have their own night of prayer. I found it hard to believe in any of them during this time. Morska could swim across the sea and liberate Ratoa, yet she stayed primarily in Vorpal from what I heard. Enror and Aridia, the wolf and the witch, would most likely condone Muda's actions and be on his side. That left the elf god, and from what I read about him, he cared more for himself than his people. Then it happened. One day, one of Muda's men grabbed me by my collar and dragged me to an ancient library underneath Rotoa. I had no idea this place existed, and I wouldn't be surprised if our elders didn't either. It was beautiful, and so big that I could not see the wall where it ended from where I was standing. I wondered why Muda's men didn't just burn it down, but apparently, 
Muda was looking for a specific volume from the library. I wanted to ask how he even knew this library existed, but I also wanted to keep my teeth, so I thought it best not to pry. I spent the next few days going through the books, and the only information I received was that the book Muda was looking for had two wolves on it. As I sifted through book after book, Muda's men would occasionally send down more slaves to help look. I feared I might not be moving fast enough for their liking, but I think they just realized the library was too big for one person to cover alone. I never found the book with the wolves on it that Muda wanted, but I did find a book that stuck out to me. It had this deranged face on it, and I could have sworn the moment I found it that the eyes glowed. Curious. I picked it up and began to read. If Muda's men caught me distracted by another book, they would have probably killed me. The first chapter in the book read, Rask, the Forgotten God. I had to read more, but I knew they wouldn't let me. So I hid the book in my shirt and waited for that night in my cell. I shared the book with the others, and we each began to read about this other god whom none of us had heard of before. If the main gods on Fenrir would not come to our aid, then perhaps... We all thought it was wishful thinking. But we took one of our nights dedicated to the four gods who did not answer our call, and we joined hands and prayed to Rask. In the book, it stated that Rask was a god of all elements, and many of us began to think that maybe he was the one who created the others. But judging by the history inside the book, it felt more like Rask came into existence at the same time as the others. But since he wasn't present on Fenrir, people didn't know about him. Then again, someone must have known enough to write the book. Days passed, and some of us continued to pray to Rask. But most of us assumed he was a false god, or forgotten for a reason until we woke up one day and our cell doors were open. I remember this day very vividly, as I woke up sweating, a rarity in Rotoa with the harsh climate. As a matter of fact, I will never forget that day because of the weather in general. It was a warmth I never knew before that moment. I joined the others some of which had been awake for a while and trying to fill in everyone on what was happening. I wanted to listen, to better understand, but something was drawing me outside. Maybe it was the fact that I had been stuck in an old ancient library for days, or because I had spent a long time in those cells. I just wanted to breathe fresh air. When I got outside, I took a deep breath, but felt the sun hitting me and Rotoa. I immediately opened my eyes and looked around to find the once snowy land of Rotoa melting. Not the buildings, of course, but the snow all around us was beginning to melt away. I wondered what happened to Muda's men, and I was most likely the only one to wonder that so soon. I made my way to the building Muda was using as his personal headquarters and found him and his men frozen. Despite the sudden heat wave we were experiencing in Rotoa, Muda and his men were now made of ice, with no signs of melting. I rushed outside to tell the others, and that's when I saw it. How I missed this on my way inside, I'm not sure. The whole experience must have overwhelmed me. I looked down at the ground, and etched within it, under the snow that had melted, was the same face I saw on the book. The face of Rask, the Forgotten God.
So good, man. So good. Blue Wolf did such an amazing job, man. And dude, that comment had me laughing like the whole time I was because you made that comment like pretty early on in the recording. I mean in the uh in the playback there, but I uh I'm so used to Twitch where I could just react and respond to comments like immediately. And and I have to like sit there and just be like, I wanna react to this so bad. Uh, but I'm sorry that you got woken up by a massive storm, but the thanks Rast thing had me laughing. Um, yeah, so Blue Wolf is in chat right now. Uh, definitely check him out on Twitter. I linked his YouTube uh, just before. Uh, he got woken up by that storm, apparently. Um, yeah, this one is uh, pretty interesting and uh, pretty creepy and eerie. Uh, and I found a good, a good background music to, to show that. When I edited the the background music, it's very choppy. So whenever the music loops, you can tell that I edited it. And uh, that kind of triggers me a little bit. But I also thought it kind of adds to the eeriness of it. So I don't think it's like that noticeable or, or that bad. It just bothers me because I messed up the edit. I guess. But, uh, but it still kind of works. So, uh, But yeah, Blue Wolf did an amazing job um i remember jake and i were talking about how it would be a good idea to maybe get a deeper voice uh as an option and uh, that's when he introduced me to blue wolf and i mean he's got one of the coolest voices i've ever heard in my life so uh pretty jealous of how cool his voice is actually uh so yeah we'll definitely be using blue wolf a lot in the uh in the future uh especially for these like kind of darker or more mysterious stories um had a great time recording this. Yeah, man, you uh, you you killed it. You knocked it out of the park for sure. Uh, that ending is like so good too. When when you just say like it's it's rest, the forgotten god. I'm like yes, this is so good. Uh, I remember when you sent it to me. I was just like this this is like exactly what I was picturing and crushed it. Um, what uh what's in, what's cool about this story is it's our first story on this northern continent that is uh you know like similar to earth because the the godlike being that created fenrir uh knows of earth and other planets and you know like it being colder the more north you go so, so she create creates this like continent more north of where the main stuff happens on the main continent that is you know very similar to how it is kind of here right so it's uh it's this very like snowy cold place um at least like when you first get to the continent where where the story kind of takes place and uh, not a lot is known about this. Um, what the last story about Charlemagne is, is meant to set up is that like these people that travel by boat and, and these pirates too, um, they kind of learn about these other continents and these other places because of traveling and stuff on the boats. So um, like, it's not that these places are completely unknown, but uh, not a lot of people really travel there or go there. Um, but obviously people got there to begin with because there's civilizations live, like, living there. Um, and I, I think we'll explore more of the North um, in the future. Um, I don't know how soon exactly because um, it was around this time that I started thinking about how we were going to set up the blocks. So, um, so now I'm kind of not necessarily pressured, but there's more focus on setting up um the base of Fenrir and its origins and stuff in this first set of 50 and then focusing completely on the war time in the next set of 50 so uh the odds of us going north or maybe even um dabbling in in the kingdom of Sabia which is also on another continent uh which is actually going to be referenced and talked about in the next one that we're going to watch um is becoming like less and less but we, we have like a lot to play with there um and that's been kind of set up here too so we we can do like some backstory on uh muda and his men we could touch more on rask in the future um and the people that were affected by the events of this story uh could also come up later and uh you know it's interesting to see uh why Rask is forgotten and uh, what this means exactly with him um, interfering in what's happening here. Because um, 
did they awaken something maybe they weren't supposed to awaken? Um, we'll find that out in the future. But uh, it's important to know that there are other gods besides the wolf, the mermaid, the elf, and uh, running around on Fenrir. So um, that's going to be important later. So uh, a lot of kind of setting the tone and setting the base of everything that's going on. See what happens with Rask in the future, but it is possible we won't really go back to this uh, this area anytime soon, but know that I'm cooking up some stories in here, don't worry. Well, we'll definitely be going back, but big shout out to Blue Wolf. Uh, I appreciate you coming by for the stream as well, man. Uh, but definitely check him out. He did an amazing job. He'll be coming back soon uh, in the next set. Um, look forward to you. a story about Ian, who is a gladiator that was part of the Elmore group that was enslaved by Ilfor and sent over to Sabia. So uh, we're going to see uh, what happens when fight. But um, this one, I tried to fool around with some, some new things with, um, with the music, the background music specifically. There's some like changes and things that we haven't done before in this one. Um, I like the way that it came out. Uh, I'm curious to see what other people think about it. Um, I haven't gotten like a lot of feedback on that part of the story, but uh, Zaf returns to voice this one and uh, we'll listen to it and then we'll talk about it after. Yan put his head back against the wall behind him and closed his eyes. Outside, in the arena, he could hear the fighting, the smashing of bones, the splattering of blood, and the sound of crackling fire. He knew his teacher, Natalie, was out there, chosen to fight, forced to fight. Here in the Dry Track arena, men fought men and women fought women. For that, Jan was glad. He did not want to fight Natalie. Not because she was his mentor, but because none of them would stand a chance against her. Despite the gender-specific matchups, Yarn and the people of Elmore were new to the arena, and they had a custom to weed out the weak. Your first few fights weren't against people, but instead against monsters taken straight from the endless sands of Sabia. If you couldn't beat the monsters, you were dead. If you were victorious, you were moved on to the next phase. Combat against one of Drytrek's gladiators. Yan and the others weren't told when they would be fighting, but he hadn't fought yet, so he assumed he would be next. A smart assumption as one of the Drytrek arena guards grabbed him by the arm and threw him near a metal gate. Peering through it, Jan could see the aftermath of Natalie's victory. Three dead beasts lay scattered around the area, and the little dry trek guards put out the flames on the ground. Jan waited patiently as the guards cleaned up the remains, then the gate in front of him opened. He walked out slowly into the arena. The crowd was getting restless. Jan was quite surprised with how many people showed up. The people of Elmore weren't told much about Sabia. The kingdom was just north of where the arena was located, but rumor that the queen who ruled there had no idea that these gladiator matches were being held in her own kingdom. Sabia was vast, so it is possible that the arena went under the radar, but there are other rumors going around that the Queen of Sabia was an undead monster 
who would probably approve of what was going on here instead of trying to shut it down. These were issues Jan couldn't concern himself with as he stood in the middle of the arena, awaiting his opponent. Finally, a gate opened. Jan could see two guards struggling to hold back a very, very large monster scorpion. The scorpion threw them aside and rushed out into the open as the guards closed the gate. Jan was only given a few pieces of armor that barely covered his body. There were weapons all over the arena to use, but he would have to find them if he wanted to use them. As the scorpion moved side to side, dangerously close to the crowd in attendance, Jan panicked and stuck his hands on the sand to try and find one of the aforementioned weapons. Before he could find one, the scorpion became aware of his presence. As if the beast knew why it was there, it pursued Jan with the killer instinct. Its large, pointy tail came crashing down just in front of Jan, and he managed to roll out of harm's way. He felt something against his back as it rolled, and he noticed a spear on the ground. Luckily, Natalie had trained him in all manners of weapons. Stumping the ground to force the spear up into his hand in one swift motion, Yan drove the spear into the scorpion's mouth. Even the scorpion was taken by surprise as the crowd gasped. Its tail continued to try and hit Yan, but he dodged it with each attack with ease. Finally, he steadied his feet in the sand and used all of his might to push forward, driving the spear deeper. A horrifying screech exited the scorpion as it did its last breath. Pure silence filled the arena. No one thought it would be over this fast, and no one thought Jan would be the victor. Once the silence broke, the crowd cheered for Jan! Jan nodded and dropped the spear, then headed for his gate to return. But it wasn't his gate that opened. It was the gate that the scorpion came from. Jan realized in this moment that he had become unlucky. Since arriving in the Dry Trek Arena, the other prisoners, as well as the other gladiators, had spoken of a man. The Dry Trek Arena's champion. Azai. If someone impressed Azai, he wanted to meet them. And fight them. Supposedly, he wasn't a very patient man. And yeah, he was about to learn that first hand. Unfortunately for Yan, that only men fought men and women fought women, as he was sure that Azai would pick Natalai to fight. A fight that Natalai would surely win, but given what he had heard of Azai so far, Yan didn't like his chances. Azai was not what you would expect from a gladiator champion. He was tall, not very muscular, and looked more like a model than a fighter. Men and women alike adored him, and he presented himself in a way that was very elegant and Devonair. However, it would be a fatal mistake to underestimate him in the arena. The armor that they gave Azai was leather and covered most of his body. His sword was a katana that they say he took from the dead hands of the first man he killed in the Dry Trek arena. Yan found himself without a choice and returned to the center of the sand where Azai approached him. Azai didn't say a word, and Yan chose to do the same. If he was going to earn his place in the Dry Trek Arena, he would need to prove that he wasn't afraid of Azai. Even if he lost this fight, if he somehow managed to keep his life, it would force the other prisoners and guards to respect him. Yan threw the first punch, but every martial arts attack he had learned from that alive was 
easily dodged by Asai with very little effort. Yan ran to the scorpion's corpse that still littered the battlefield and removed the spear, once again throwing every attack he knew at Azai. But the Tri Trek Arena's champion continued to nonchalantly avoid each individual strike. Yan was breathing heavy, the heat of the midday sun beating on him, and the sand made it hard to focus. He readied himself for another spear strike and jumped at Azai with everything he had. Azai finally removed his katana from its sheath and swatted the spear out of Yan's hands. When Yan once again touched the ground, he stumbled and fell to his knees. Azai lifted his katana in the air with one hand. When Yan looked up at him, he saw the sun shine around Azai and reflect off the steel on the blade above him. Despite the cheering of the crowd, Yan only thought of how he let his teacher down. I thought you were worthy, said Azai. I was wrong. And with that, Azai brought down his blade. Yo, what's going on, Marco? Uh, so Zaf did an amazing job with the the voiceover in there. Uh, that's another one, like kind of like Jake and I were talking about earlier about the like you lied, and where he goes uh, about sticking the spear into the scorpion's mouth. <laughs> that's another good one. Um, Zaf did amazing. Uh, I'm pretty happy with the music for that one. Uh, it was the first time I wanted to try to give a character like a theme song uh so that that music that it switches to when the Azai guy shows up um that is kind of like his theme and then uh whenever he's in battle uh i'll add like the, uh, the like dum dum going on in the background it's very sephiroth-esque i guess is what i was going for but um yeah i don't know i like it so I uh, I'm pretty happy with how the music turned out in that one, and then like the 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 drumming or whatever you want to call it cuts off, and then the music gets like louder, and it kind of plays this out because it's kind of like pretty somber. That um, I mean, this is kind of like the first story about a character that dies by the end of it. So uh, you know, it's interesting. At least I think it is. But um yeah, no, so um that was that was an interesting story too because it it's it's showing like the aftermath of what happens with the people of Elmore. And it kind of gives us some insight into uh what's going on over there in Sabia, right? So like it's kinda in, well it it's known basically that, that Queen Rima doesn't know this is even happening. Excuse me. Um so they're they're having these like gladiator fights without her knowing but uh you know that this takes place after the queen rima story because she uh is already considered an undead monster uh by a lot of the people in sabia as well so um it, it's pretty interesting to see like um these other characters get referenced uh in these stories and you kind of learn like where they're at uh it's also really cool because you get to see like just how awesome uh natalie is in the sense that like she just leaves the entire battlefield like covered in flames and uh she took on three monsters so yen fights one giant scorpion right but like it, it's known that she fought three at the same time and she just absolutely crushed them 
So, um, you know, it, kind of, it hypes up Natalie a bit more um, and shows that, like, she's just destroying stuff in the arena. Uh, it shows, like, the amount of respect and almost to a degree, like, the amount of fear that uh, her own students have of, like, having to fight her, where he's like, I'm glad that men fight men and women fight women because I don't have to fight Natalie. Um, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see where that goes, uh, especially with Azai and Natalie uh, possibly fighting at some point. Um, so it's a lot of setup and build up and a different spin on things where like a character actually dies that the story is about. Uh, it hypes up Azai, it continues to hype up Natalie, which we've kind of done since the beginning. Um, I need to stop using names that end in AI, I guess. We got Kazai, Kai, Natalai, Azai. But I don't know, I think it sounds cool. Uh, it's fine. We just won't make any more. The ones that we have are fine. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, it's an interesting one, and it's it's a fun one. And, and Zaf, Zaf did an amazing job with it. Um, he gave Azai this kind of like, you know, debonair is what I used to describe him. It's kind of like he's not what you would expect from a gladiator champion or this like super, super strong dude. He's very, very anime, I guess, in the sense that like he doesn't look like a fighter, but very strong. We'll, we'll see where it goes from there. Like I said, uh, Sabia and like the continents up north. Uh, like where Ratoa is and stuff. I'm not sure how much we'll really dive into that um, right now, but uh, as the story progresses, they will be more and more uh, relevant. Um, so the next one, which is number 19, um, the number 19 means a lot to me. I was born on May 19th. Uh, I use 19 for a lot of things. Um, so because 19 was so important to me, I knew I wanted to get art made for this one. Uh, so we got coin box tees to make um, art for uh, the background for this one of uh, Juvenile the Poet. Um, she is um, almost like a record keeper in her own way. Um, there is something very magical about her. Uh, this story is completely different than a lot of the other stories that we've done in the sense that it, uh, it rhymes completely. Um, and it acts more as like a recap for the first 18 fantasy distractions leading up to this one. I would like to do, um, I would like to do a um, recap fantasy distraction, maybe every 19 like this. Uh, and maybe with some different styles, possibly with, like, the music. This one was actually supposed to be music-related. Um, I was trying to write it as a song, but I'm still um, trying to get better at that. I don't really have a lot of experience doing that. I originally wanted to write it as a song, and my sister was going to sing it. Uh, but my sister just had a baby, so I didn't really want to put that pressure on her. Plus, I was having trouble writing it. So it just didn't feel like the right time to do it. Uh, so I kind of took what I had for the song idea, modified it a little bit, and just went like the poem route, um, which it's not like a traditional poem, but it, it is just like a rhyming um, or like a rhyme scheme, I should say. So um, this one I was very nervous about, and I was really worried about pitching it to any of the um, voice actors. And uh, Cecilia was interested in taking it on, and she did an absolutely amazing job with it. It turned out so much better than I even imagined it would come out in my head, and she just did great with it and really just uh, took it on full, full steam ahead and just exceeded all expectations. So uh, hats off to her for sure. Um, she did incredible. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna listen to it and talk about it. Um, I don't know. We'll talk about too much of it uh, because it's recapping ones that we've already talked 
pretty thoroughly about, but uh, it is one of my favorite just because of how worried I was about it and how amazing it turned out. Um, I think it's always going to be a special one to me. Uh, and it's a super short one, which is also pretty interesting, but um, I didn't want to expand uh, what I had. Like when she sent me the recording and it was only about like three minutes long, I didn't really want to like add too much to it. So I just kind of left left it as is at the three minute mark. I think it's a nice little solid recap. It's a nice number. Uh, it's got some really cool art from Coinbox Tees. And uh, let's check it out and then we'll talk more about it. It's also got uh, this background of just like water hitting docks, which I think is kind of nice because it makes you feel like you're on the ship with her. And uh, it is supposed to be Charlemagne's ship. So just know that Charlemagne is traveling with this character. So she's probably going to pop back up in a story or two in the future, if not another story of her own, where she might be recapping more stories and rhyming the whole time. But uh, let's take a listen. Reminiscing about the days of old and just watching our history unfold. Sit down, let me tell you a tale about these battles that raged and pirates that sailed. An epic showdown on a mountain so high where the world changed but neither men die. King Ingvar is ruthless, praise be to Lord Kazai. Fires burning, the rise and fall of Natalai. Cities crumble, but we don't know why. It must be Kai, the starlight samurai. His katana is surely a weapon to fear. Let's just hope he never makes it to Fenrir. Grab a chair, I have more stories to share. About mercenaries and a queen with sand-laden hair. Some are near and some are far. Time-traveling bards and but one mage from Asgar. Mercenaries that do bad things and one lost in the bog. A goddess that turns to mist and one that lives in the fog. Speaking of gods and goddesses, they were fooled by a trickster's maneuver. And whatever happened to that beauty in Vesuva? Word is that she's much smaller now, but that isn't stopping Sharla, looking out from the forward bow. How do I know so much? Well, I am a seeker of knowledge that rivals that of an immortal record keeper. Gather round, don't let Drew make a sound, or he'll take what you own and he'll never be found. Those monsters from the box, now those were quite odd. More on those later, as well as the Forgotten God. A cupcake from Midport, a treat for a witch. The war in the north, to that subject we switch. Two legends will clash, and Fenrir will pay. Like hens should do, we all should pray. Maybe they should settle the score in Dry Trek Arena. If people knew it existed, including Queen Rima. I hope you like what you've heard and I hope you come back for more. You don't want to miss what happens next. You won't want to miss the dragon's roar. Reminiscing about days of glory, the legends, the wars, the story. So this was a really fun one to write and and sassy did so good with it um what's funny and like a little like behind the scenes kind of thing uh for this one is that um sassy recorded it like started recording it um similar to the way she did the uh Ilya one and uh when she got up to uh trickster's maneuver that rhyme um like whatever happened to that beauty of Vesuva and, and all that um I totally remember the line 100%. I just can't, you know, uh, I actually don't remember what I rhymed with. But you know what I mean. Uh, that part, um, she felt it would sound better with an accent. 
that she did it she recorded the whole thing with the accent that we used it rap god that's right um and uh and she recorded it with that accent and she sent it to me and she's like i tried an accent let me know what you think and i was like this is so good like it doesn't even sound like her like if you listen to ilia uh record keeper and then you listen to this one like you almost can't even tell it's the same person and uh it's great she did an amazing job with it and i think that's really fun interesting so uh yeah it's just a little behind the scenes kind of thing that uh happened and is interesting to me but but uh yeah this story just recaps um fantasy distraction 1 through 18. Uh, i will probably do something similar every 19. we'll just recap like the previous 18. Like I said, 19 is a special number to me, so don't ask me why it's every 19. I just like the number 19. Um, so we'll we'll do a little recap, uh, things like that throughout. Uh, because like the reason why it should be the one before like the the top of the set is because like the top of the set's always gonna be setting up something or or a big one. Excuse me. With like more plot driven things so like to have the recap be that number it's like it would be easier from a recap standpoint uh but at the same time i i i think it's important to keep like 20 and 30 and 40 as like very important stories um and not just like a like waste it on like a recap story not that the recap stories aren't good or fun or uh interesting but just that um I want to keep those those end of the set stories more uh important to the overall story um that being said we do have a story coming up early in the next set that is also going to be read by sassy i believe um it's going to do the opposite so it's actually going to tease a bunch of stories coming up so it's going to be the opposite of what we just listened to so like this one referenced all the stories that happened already uh we have a story coming up in the next set that will tease a bunch of stories coming up so man bun one yo what's up Loden? um i don't know i haven't tied my i haven't like put my hair up yet so all this hair that's happening i have yet to actually do anything with it i just let it run wild uh so i have no idea how to do a man uh so i don't know when that's gonna happen but uh how you been man how's everything um so yeah so the recap one is pretty great we do tease a couple of things in this uh like you you won't want to miss the dragon's roar uh is gonna be important um not in the next set but soon um so that's that's a little bit of a tease um juvenile herself um is a little bit mysterious right because she's got as you saw in the picture she has these runes on her arms uh that tie into how she's able to keep tabs on everything like she's a record keeper but she's actually not a record keeper so um we may tie her into more stories and um uh, same thing with her calling charlemagne charla that's just kind of what they call her for short uh so when she says like word is she's much smaller now in reference to Aliana. Uh and then she says that's not gonna stop Sharla from looking out from you know the forward bow or whatever, the front of the ship. Um so uh they just call Charlemagne Sharla for short. That's just her nickname. Uh, about to look like uh Erin oh again with a clean shave of man, but yeah, a lot of people keep uh, giving me that. That's the guy from Attack on Titan, right? That Jake likes, yeah. I keep getting that a lot. I got that on Instagram as well. The potential. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, that's actually the second time I've heard that. So <laughs> maybe I should cosplay him. I don't know. Cosplay him before the hair is gone. I got one of those um, COVID masks that looks like the Winter Soldier's mask uh because i have my hair is very winter soldier right now when it's like down um i gotta i gotta make an instagram post with that it's gonna be something like uh when you when you want to be captain america but you're you're actually the winter soldier either that or i'm gonna combine um 
Not Another Teen Movie is one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, and Chris Evans is the main character in there. It's a comedy movie. And, uh, and the way he describes the Winter Soldier reminds me of a scene in there where he describes one of the girls. And I want to combine those two scenes uh, if I make a post, a Winter Soldier post. Uh, it would have been awesome if they were adding Winter Soldier to the Marvel's Avengers game to coincide with the Falcon and the Winter Soldier show. Uh, then I, I probably would have done like a Winter Soldier cosplay stream. But um, I, I see no reason to do it right now because they didn't add him to the game yet. All right. Um, so that's pretty much it for number 19. Uh, it's a recap. Uh, it was really hard to write. I was very nervous as, as to how it was going to come out, but uh, Bassey just removed all that nervousness I had. And literally, like, she messaged me, like, I'm about to record it. And I was like, all right, cool. And I don't even think it took her, like, an hour to send me the file. And she sent me the file. And, like, all my nervousness about releasing it went away. Like, as soon as I heard it, I was just like, this is amazing. It came out so good. There's no reason to be worried. Um, and what was also kind of fun about this one is we, we were brainstorming some, like, shorter video ideas. Um, so it's, it's a shorter video compared to a lot of the other ones. So it, it was kind of like a good way for us to kind of test, uh, the waters with that. So, uh, so that was, that was nice too about this one. It was, it gave us an opportunity to kind of see how that would go. And, uh, turns out it didn't go too bad. Um, what I don't really understand right now is um, the fantasy distraction that came out today. Uh, I did my usual, like ran my ads and stuff that I do and voted it the same way that I always do. But uh, it's only gotten seven views so far. So we definitely got to get it some more views. It'll go up. I'm sure it'll even out and work itself out. Brand things. I feel like the ad that I ran for it is failing. I might have to re, not necessarily re upload it, but just uh, run it. See how it goes. Seven views right now, though, and it's it'll go up overnight. Um, uh, gotta get it some more views, chat. Um, Derpy did an amazing job with this one. His accent in this is so good. I called it Mercer esque, which is funny because I'm wearing a Critical Role shirt right now. But uh, uh, Derby does a really fun accent in this one, so uh, we'll listen to it and then we'll talk about it. But this story is very important for the, uh, the grand scheme of things as far as fantasy distractions goes. He also ad-libbed a lot of really cool stuff into this one that I didn't write. So when I released this uh, in written form on that, that top, top of the show um, site, that top, top of, I have no idea how it's pronounced. I think it's Tapas. Uh, when I release the written form of this on that site, it's going to be slightly different from this because uh, uh, therapy put its own spin on it, but it came out like way better than what I wrote. So uh, hopefully people just listen to it. And, but uh, here we go. Let's listen and then we'll talk about it. Hello there. You're the one that wanted to hear the story of the chameleon, huh? Well, sure, I'll oblige. You can sit there and just listen. <clears throat> In the devastating aftermath of the worldwide natural disaster that most Fenians attributed to the battle on top of Mount Shair, many children were left as orphans. Though Anna was one long before that, she never met her real parents, and she lived in an orphanage in a small town to the southernmost part of the Obsidian. This town, known as Red Deck, was far from the most luxurious of places to live, basically the slums of Obsidian. Red Deck and a few businesses, and almost everyone living there was struggling to get by. Young Anna wanted to help the people of Red Deck, but she didn't know how, until one day, Anna's life changed forever. A traveler came through town, one that was well versed in magic. 
showed off his talents to the orphans. Magicians often come through Red Deck. Hired by the owners of the orphanage to try to give children some entertainment. Anna had seen quite a few in her day, but his travels were different. His act is that you would expect from any magician. Until he got closer to the finale of his bit, he presented the children with an empty bucket. Showed it to them to confirm that it's emptiness. Then, with a snap of his fingers, the bucket filled with water. In a town struggling to get by, people took notice of a man making water out of thin air. Strong enough as a cheap trick, the people started leaving him alone. But later that night, while getting ready for bed and helping the other younger orphans get settled in, one of the orphans noticed that a strand of Anna's hair had changed color. It had blue highlights. After confirming in a mirror, one of the caretakers came by to check on what the ruckus was all about. Upon noticing the blue highlights in Anna's hair, their face twisted into more of a look of concern and ushered Anna out of the room. That night, without explanation, Anna slept in a room all alone. It had been the first time she was separated from the other orphans since she got there. At only 16 years old, Anna didn't know what to expect. When morning came, one of the adults had helped her out in the orphanage came to get her. Phoebe was her name, and she was the most loved and respected of the caretakers. Phoebe escorted Anna outside and told her that the lineage which she came from was very special. Taken aback by her words, Anna immediately tried to dig deeper. Unfortunately, there was only so much Phoebe knew. But she knew that Anna had a special abilities. She asked Anna what she thought of the magic show before. Anna thinking some parts were real and some were fake and pointed out that creating water in the bucket was most probably the one that was real. It felt different somehow, she said. Phoebe went and fetched an empty bucket and placed it on the floor in front of Anna. The two stood in silence for a moment. Anna looked up at Phoebe and back down at her hands. Finally, she looked past her own hands and at the empty bucket. The closer eyes, Phoebe moved behind her, and got Anna's hair out of her shoulders and out of the way, pulling the strands back and getting her out tangles with her fingers. Anna started thinking about the time by the border of the warble, the waterfall there, real nice and pretty, thinking of the flow of the water, the water particles in the air, and all that mist. Last but not least, pray to the fish goddess Morska. Thinking about all of these things, she eventually managed to fill up the bucket. Excited by this, she exclaimed she could finally help Red Dick. She could sate all of their thirsts, and hopefully in the future, sate all their hunger. In her excitement, she embraced Phoebe. No one would go thirsty again in Red Dick. The water magic stayed with her for a long time. However, on her 18th birthday, her life took another sudden turn. King Ingvar and Lord Kazai were on the brink of war. But both rulers had to secure their own land first, before fighting each other. King Ingvar's obsidian knights were terrorizing the entire countryside, and Red Dick was no exception. Fathers and mothers were protecting their children, and the caretakers desperately tried to save as many orphans as they could. Anna, being the oldest, helped the caretakers get the orphans to safety, and helped hide them in a cellar underneath the orphanage. Once that was done, Phoebe grabbed Anna by the hand and led her to another secure location, a hiding spot, inside one of the wooden walls of the orphanage. She told her to stay there and never leave. And only nodded in response, fearing the wrath of the Obsidian Knights. Before Phoebe left, she left her with one more message. That she could never, ever trust anyone else with her magic. 
Anna could feel Phoebe's hands shaking too as she held them in her own. But just as Anna was about to turn around and go to her hiding spot, the sword swung down and slashed Phoebe from behind. An obsidian knight stood behind Phoebe. As she collapsed on the ground, Anna tried to run, but the obsidian knight grabbed her by the hair and turned around towards the entrance of the room. Look at what we got here, began the knight as Anna turned around and saw a tall man with scars all over his face standing in the doorway. Anna was even more terrified of the sight of the man, but suddenly realized the man was holding her by the hair. Didn't know the man either. Wait, who are ye? He called out like an idiot. Anna could see a few dead obsidian knights behind the man in question. She could also see he was holding a katana drenched in their blood. Obsidian Nine let go of her and she dropped to the floor. She closed her eyes and looked away, but the fight, if you could even call it that, was over in mere seconds. The man holding her by the hair a moment ago hit the floor with a hard thud. Scared, Anna surrendered immediately, put her hands up. A man asked who she was and if she was Anna. She exclaimed yes. Anna looked up at him. Despite his scary appearance, she suddenly felt very calm around him. As she stood up, the man put his bloodied katana back in his sheath. He introduced himself as Jack, and that he'd been hired to protect her. Well, that's the story. That's all I know. Now, I'm not going to be telling it again. Well, unless you're willing to cough up a few more coins. <clears throat> not leave me to my drink it makes me so happy that you said that Lonan because uh, I know Derpy wants to do that voice again so uh well, we're definitely going to have to use it again. Um, I love this so much because it's so, like, it's so well done. Derpy did amazing with it. And, and like, I totally feel where Derpy's coming from as far as uh, listening to himself. I hate listening to myself. When I watch back, like, a clip or, like, one of my streams or um, I was actually watching back the the first recap stream just to remember like get a feel for like how i i did the first one and oh my i hate listening to myself like that that's why i'm really happy that we have so many uh voice actors now for fantasy distractions because i don't have to record as many things myself uh because i really don't like listening to myself either but i think that's normal i think everybody kind of hates the sound of their own voice uh especially like recording it because like when I speak, it's not what I sound like when I hear myself on a recording. So, um, I I hate it. But you know, it is what it is. Not much you can do about it. I think I've gotten more used to it just from streaming and stuff. But uh, when doing projects like the fantasy distractions and stuff, it definitely like bothers me. But yeah, Lonin actually uh, recorded something for uh, next week's fantasy distraction, uh, where we're all kind of just like jumping in and doing a paragraph. So. Uh, um but you did a great job with that Lonan, so don't don't worry too much about that but uh other than derpy's amazing accent for this uh it's so soothing yet driven and grounded and got that good veteran vibe yeah it's so good it was so well done um but the uh the story itself other than derpy's amazing voice acting for it uh the story itself is actually very important to the future of um fantasy distractions more specifically during those that wartime block we were talking about um jack and anna are very important to the story um going forward and and their their journey together is um what i started writing the ebook that these fantasy distraction stories are very loosely based on um so I, I have a lot of their story thought up and ready to go. Um, it's just a matter of like the fantasy distraction, like story and overall storyline uh, catching up to that point. 
once it does, they're they're very, very important to the story. So um we're kind of just setting some seeds about Jack and about Anna. Um there's a lot of room for background and backstory here. Um more so for Jack than Anna, but like um we know that at the end of number 10, which is where we left off the last recap, that uh, Jack had gone into the bog where Aradia is and uh, was never heard from again until he emerges from there. Uh, so we have to fill in a lot of gaps as far as that's concerned. And, uh, and now that he's out of there, we know that he's covered in these scars, like he's been through some things. Um, so, uh, we're definitely going to explore a lot more of Jack's story, uh, a lot more of Anna's story, and a lot more of their journey together, um, in the future. Um, there's going to be things trickled in between now and 50, uh, but they become way more important after 50. So, um, they will be teased a bit more throughout these next few, and then once 50 hits, it it's like they become the main characters almost almost as important as Ingvar and Kazai throughout at 50, if not more important. So it'll be uh it'll be it'll be interesting. Um I think at the end of last recap stream I teased a couple of the ones coming up. Uh so I will do that again. Uh the most important one being next week's which is a story called Transmission. Excuse me. A story called Transmissions that is um a series of transmissions sent in about the Starlight Samurai. Um I for the most part have abandoned that original idea that I mentioned on the last recap stream where every um like the eleventh one of every like set or whatever, however you want to call it, would be about like uh, a character that we heard of already. So like Natalie was number one and she was number eleven. I was number two and he'll be number twenty one. Um, that is technically still true because transmissions is about Kai. Um, but after that, I think we're gonna kind of stray from that. Uh, just because I then changed the plan to the set idea and the block idea. So um, I had to condense a lot of the stories down. And there are stories that would have been like the continuation of certain stories that I have to have happen earlier than uh, when they were originally planned to happen. So um, that kind of shifted things around a bit and kind of made me do away with that plan. Um, but next week's is Transmissions. It is individual paragraphs of um, these people calling in and complaining or uh, concerned about Kai and uh, the destruction that he leaves behind. And um, what we did is we're, we're doing uh, each one of us who does the voice acting for Fantasy Distractions uh, has their own paragraph. So... Uh, everybody's going to be reading a paragraph. It's going to be the first one that we've done that is kind of like this more than one voice actor collaboration. Um, I'm going to try to use some like sound effects, um, especially for like when the transmissions change, uh, kind of like just like a staticky like switching of the next like message. Um, so that one should be fun. And it's uh, a nice opportunity for us all to kind of like work together on something, which I think is very cool. Um, after that, we're going to do um, a story that's a little bit more in like Kazai's side of things. Um, we're going to do a story that is actually told from the perspective of that godlike being who created Fenrir that I mentioned earlier. We're going to do a story from her perspective, uh, which is going to be very interesting. Uh, number 24 is one that uh, the Pizza Gang, uh, Jake, who we were talking to earlier, who voiced Ingvar and uh, Birch. Um, we're doing a our first story that is a guest writer. So uh, Jake wrote number 24. I believe he might also be voice acting it. I don't think that's set in stone yet. Uh, but we're having our first guest writer, um, which will be for number 24. Um, 
Number 25 is back to a story about Ingvar's side of things and the the origins of Dingvar. If you were there for the stream, you know what I'm talking about. Um, then we got another one about Ilfor and um, the rest I'd rather not tease because it's kind of spoilery. And uh, some of them I haven't written yet. I'm, I'm up to 27. I wrote 27. Uh, I'm actually up to writing 28 so hopefully 28 29 30 i'll have done soon and then uh, we can start focusing on the next set after that but um now that i've been writing them live on twitch uh twitch.tv slash val underscore starlight i've been writing fantasy distractions live every monday uh i didn't do it tonight because we had the recap stream but uh every monday night i've been writing fantasy distractions live uh, so if you want to see the ones that are coming up and kind of get uh, a little spoiled on them, I guess, uh, on what's coming, uh, you can just watch me on Twitch. We'll be writing them live every Monday. Um, when we reach the week of Dingvar, uh, number 25, uh, we'll be doing a podcast on my Twitch channel as well, uh, where I'll get on most likely with Jake, probably Derpy. Uh, last time we had Zaf as well. Uh, as many of the voice actors that I could get together for it, we'll do a podcast on Twitch where we just talk about a lot of the uh, behind the scenes stuff and and just um, you know the chat and probably talk about some other stuff as well. So uh, that one will be coming up in a couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you guys so much for hanging out. I appreciate it. If anybody's still in chat that hasn't liked the video, I don't know if that matters. Uh, like it if you feel like it. I don't know. Uh, definitely go give Anna Magic Chameleon more views. Um, it deserves more views because Derpy did amazing. And uh, I really want to get the views up on that one since it's the newer one. Not really sure why my ad didn't really work. Usually I get a couple of views from ads. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working. What happened there? Uh, but I'll, I'll try to fix that. But uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I appreciate you. And um, hopefully we can uh, do this again in 10 weeks. Uh, I cannot believe how fast the uh, time between the last recap stream and this one was. Like and hit the bell icon. Thank you, Loaded. I appreciate that, man. But uh, yeah, so thank you guys so much for tuning in. I have to remember how to end a YouTube stream. I think I know how. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you in 10 weeks or on Twitch, one or the other. Tune in every week, Monday, uh, 12.30 p.m. is when I post the new ones, premiere the new ones. Uh, so look forward to transmissions with a whole bunch of us uh, voicing some characters and some paragraphs. And uh, I'm gonna be posting the written versions of these stories on that Tapas site. Make sure you check that out. I'll put the link in the description of the video, uh, as well as the links to all of the voice actors um, and where to find them and the, uh, the music used in the stream. Uh, I'll be able to put all of those in the description like I did last time. Uh, every like is an interaction. Each interaction brings your videos up in the ranking list, so uh, it does matter a lot, actually. Okay, so make sure you hit that like button. Thank you, Marco. I appreciate you, man. Marco is like our our biggest supporter, man. Like this guy is there for every premiere. Uh, he shares all my stuff on on Twitter. Um, much love and respect. He designed our profile picture, not the logo. The logo was Coinbox Tees, but our our little FD profile picture on YouTube. He designed that for us. So big shout out to Marco. He, he's a real one. He's a real homie. But, uh, but thank you guys so much for tuning in and I will catch you in 10 weeks.